Um, good evening. This is the uh, Board of Selectmen and the Finance Committee meeting of uh, March 8th, March, excuse me, March 9th, uh, 2021 at 6 p.m. Please ask if anybody is recording the meeting and announce that Cable is, uh, is taping the meeting. In accordance with general order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, chapter, general law, chapter 30A, section 20, relating to the 2020 COVID-19 emergency outbreak, the March 10th, 2021 public meeting of the Board of Selectmen shall be physically closed to the public to avoid group congregation. However, to view this meeting in progress, please go to facebook.com um, back, uh, backslash Lake Cam. You do not need a Facebook account to view this meeting. This meeting will be recorded and available to review at a later date on lakecam.tv. Um, please note, we do have the uh, Facebook chat feature on. So if you have a question or a comment, uh, you can make that and we'll try to address it as best we can. As a preliminary matter, my name is Rich LeCamera. I'm chairman of the Board of Selectmen. Permit me to confirm that all members of the staff and persons anticipated on the agenda are, are uh, present and can hear me. Uh, members, when I call your name, please respond to the affirmative. Uh, Selectman Day. Present. Selectman Fabian. Present. And the staff uh, basically is uh, uh, Tracy Craig McGee. Present. And uh, Todd Hassett, who's our uh, town accountant. Present. And Darren, can you uh, call the Finance Committee to order, please? Sure, I'll call the Lakeville Finance Committee meeting to order at 6.05 p.m. And we'll see who's here. Adam Lynch. Present. Larry Constant. Present. Darren Beal is present. Thank you. And uh, Nancy Lefebvre from the uh, Board of Trustees, who allows you to do you at the same time. Hey, I'd like to call the Lakeville Board of Library Trustees to order at 606. Um, I'm Nancy Johnson Lefebvre, uh, Chairman with Gross. Present. And Rich LaCamera. Here. And we have Director Jamie present. Okay, I think that's everybody on this group. I'm sorry, we do have one more person I forgot about. And there's uh, Will Corey, uh, the veterans agent. Present. Uh, I think that's Matt all we Perkins. have. Right. I think that's all we have right now. Matt Perkins. Yeah. Well. Okay. Chief Matt Perkins has just uh, joined us. <laughs> okay. Present. Okay. Thanks, Matt. All right. Um, this is an open meeting of the Electoral Board of Selectmen and Finance Committee to be conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020, due to the current state of the emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of COVID-19 virus, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public meetings. As such, the general order suspends the requirement for an open meeting law to have all meetings in publicly accessible physical locations. Further, all members of the public bodies are allowed to encourage to participate. The order, which you can find the, the posted in agenda uh, materials, um, this meeting allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely as long as reasonable public access is afforded so the, uh, the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Okay, um, first of all, I'd like to, um, I'm sure that you've all heard that the, um, the House passed the $1.9 trillion um, uh, stimulus package today. And um, we don't have all the information available, you know, as far as what the town's going to be received. But uh, we are told that uh, we're going to get $1,000 per person in Lakefield, which is roughly $1.1 million. Now, the question becomes, uh, what can we use that money for? And from what we understand, there's three different conditions at this point. One is for uh, water and sewer. Um, one is for um, um, revenue that we didn't get in the previous year, which is a good thing. That'll certainly help. Uh, and the third thing is uh, broadband uh, internet service, which I'm sure there's some things we can do with that, too. Um, the thing with the thing with the uh, the money, though, the only thing is this is really spread over three years, so uh, we don't get it all up front. We wish we did, but we don't. 
And then as far as the Plymouth County is concerned, um, they're going to get a significant amount of money as well. We have no idea at this point how that money is going to be distributed. And the regional school district, Freetown, Lakeville, and Old Colony, um, it looks like they're going to get a substantial amount you know, of uh, stimulus money, which we don't have those numbers yet. But we hope to have those numbers uh, by the end of the week. Todd, did you want to add anything to that? I know you were looking at it today, too. <laughs> Uh, no, I, I was looking at it today with a state group. Um, uh, to, to your point, the guidelines, uh, well, the, the legislature hasn't formally adopted uh, this yet. We expect that to happen shortly, and uh, soon afterwards we'll have guidelines, particularly, as you say, we're interested in the revenue recovery uh, component, the revenue loss. Okay, anybody else got any questions on it? Okay. All right. Uh, I would like to welcome the uh, veterans agent, uh, Will Corey, and uh, his budget is in uh, Health and Services five forty three in your uh, in your book. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, it's uh, like a a one point three percent increase to go along with inflation. Um, this is this is what DVS, the Department of Veteran Services, has uh, planned for uh, the increase for uh, 2022. Okay. I know, Will, it's been an extremely difficult year, you know, trying to help the veterans and meet with the veterans and um, guide them on uh, the services, you know, that have been available to them. And uh, we appreciate, you know, all your support um, in doing that. And uh, from, a, from an expense standpoint, you know, it looks like the, um, the uh, amount of request for expenses is a little less than last year at this point. So uh, I don't know if it's because of the timing of it or whatever. But uh, so it's pretty much been budgeted uh, the same for fiscal 22. Yeah, I don't. There may uh, be some meetings that uh, we'll actually do live, and uh, so I kept the the cost on that about the same, just so it won't go over or anything. But uh, um, you know, because our different associations, uh, we've been doing it virtually on Zoom like this. So in trainings, we've been doing them online too. So okay. Um, does anybody have any questions for the uh, veterans agent? Uh, Especially the questions on the bill, <clears throat> I mean, on the budget, just, you know, as Select on the camera said, well, you know, really appreciate what you do for everybody, especially given the last year and how difficult it's been. Um, you know, I think I've said before in a previous meeting, you know, I, I, I want the town to do all they can to really publish, uh, publicize everything you have to offer for our veterans, just to make sure that we're getting the word out so that people know what is out there and available to them so that folk, you know, folks don't know, hopefully we can get you in front of them and get you talking. So thank you very much for everything that you do for them. I, I do do a radio show on uh, Wednesdays out of uh, WVBF over in Taunton. Nice. It's an hour show and uh, we try to get information out on that too. It's, it's been, it's been pretty effective. Fantastic. Uh, Todd, it sounded like you want to, um, excuse me, Leah, go ahead first. No, that's all right. Todd can go. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to point out um, that uh, much of Will's budget is reimbursable um, through the state on our cherry sheet. Uh, so it's important to note that um, of this total $216,000 budget you have before you, uh, just over 108,000 is estimated to be paid by the state next year. So it's, it's about 50% uh, state funded, 50% local funded. Um, and we do get 75 cents back on the dollar. Uh, not the same year we incur the expense. It, it's, it's, there's a delay, but um, you know, many of the ordinary and, and, and other veterans benefits are reimbursable and, and Will does monthly reporting and and, um, you know, we track that and um, it's it's a great program and Will does a great job for the community. And that's just the state part of it. Um, the federal government, uh, you know, I do a lot of VA uh, comp and pen uh, claims and stuff. And uh, that's money that's brought into the town 
and uh, it it's pretty close to a uh, hundred and fifty thousand dollars a month that's actually coming in from uh, the VA into the town of Lakeville every month. And there's there's one other program that's available to the veterans as well, and that's the uh, the abatements, the veterans abatements for the uh, property taxes as well. Mm-hmm. So that's another program that the town has. Mm-hmm. But well, yeah. you know what percent of eligible um, veterans take advantage of these programs in Lakeville? Like- I don't have a percentage uh, on it. Uh, I'm always trying to. That's why one of the reasons I do the radio show is trying to get people to, uh, you know, come in and uh, get their benefits. I mean, I've been able to do a lot over this past year, you know, answering people's questions and stuff. But, uh, you know, a lot of people that are veterans don't self-identify as veterans Hmm. because they they didn't uh, get put overseas or they weren't, they didn't serve during a war time, so they don't consider themselves a veteran, yet they are veterans. Um. You know, that's that. Is, that is one issue that you know. I, I get the question all the time: Am I a veteran? Well, yes, you are. And and th- there's been such an increase of uh, females in the services over the past few years, uh, which has really made a big difference in helping uh, getting things moving. Um, so that's you know it. There's a, there's a lot of people out there that I'd still like to get in touch with and help. Okay, thank you. I yeah. Was, um, yeah, I was just going to, you know, thank Will for all his efforts and everything. And I was going to mention the, um, the abatement part too. And I uh, was on the board of assessors for four years and I would go through those and I, I, I couldn't believe how many, you know, not just veterans, but how many folks we have in the town who have lost a loved one. And, you know, um, it, it's definitely sobering. And uh, I just want to thank everyone for their service. Well, you know that, you know, always thank you for your service. Thank you thank to, you. to everyone, everyone's service, for everyone's service. The uh, DVS has uh, put in for an increase in those abatements, by the way, it hasn't been passed yet, but um, we're looking to looking forward to an increase okay. in those. Okay. Anybody else got any questions for Will? Mm-hmm. Okay. Will, we appreciate you coming. Thank you. I'll stick around for a while in case anybody puts anything on, up on chat. So. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, next is um, the uh, the library budget. Um, uh, Nancy Lefebvre, I don't know if you want to give an overview or you want Jamie, you know, to do that. I would, I would like our director to give the overview. Okay. Okay, so for this year, the Board of Selectmen asked for a level service budget and the library actually, we submitted a completely level funded budget for this year. Um, so I don't have a whole lot to go through in terms of details, but just to make uh, everyone aware that even with the level funded budget, we are fortunately able to make the requirement that we have for the state. So generally I have handouts for all of you in terms of talking about the state aid to public libraries program, which is um, something that's run at the state level. And as long as libraries meet a certain set of requirements, which includes you know, being open to the public a certain number of hours a week and not charging for services. Uh, we have different reporting that we have to do. One of the other requirements is meeting a municipal appropriation requirement. And this is based off of um, the municipal funding history. So it's the average of the prior three years for municipal appropriations plus two and a half percent. So generally I have a whole worksheet that I share with you of our prior history. So we were certified for fiscal year 20, certified for fiscal year 21, and the applications for fiscal 22 will be due in October of 21. So it's based off of the 22 budget. And um, the way that the budget was submitted as presented to you, we will still meet the requirement. I guess just to talk about detail for our budget. So the salaries are level. These actually, it 
takes into account the contractual obligations that we have and any step increases. We will have a couple of retirements this year, so that opened up some flexibility for us to meet these obligations while staying within the existing lines that we had for last year. So the total bottom line is a 0% increase. Um, as far as expenses, it's we've been making adjustments over the years to align our budget with what has been uh, needed for spending. And so there really weren't any adjustments that were needed there. We did have one um, from the water service that was put to the books line because part of the state aid to public libraries program too is making sure that you send, spend a certain portion of your budget on materials. and for a community the size of Lakeville, that means we have to spend 16% of our total budget on um, new materials available for the public. So for next year, that's going to be about $62,400 or so. That money will come, we've got about 48 one in the budget as stands as presented to you. The friends do contribute some money in terms of what they pay for museum passes. And then we generally make up the difference from state aid grants. So part of being part of the state aid to public libraries program makes you eligible to receive um, grant money. So that's cherry sheet money for the town. And we'll have to use about um, 10,000 or so from that monies to make up the the materials expenditure and you know so we're we're in line with where we need to be I don't know if there were any particular questions about our budget I don't have a question about the budget can you talk about the COVID environment I mean, what is the how are people using the library and, and what is the, what is a day like in the life of a librarian in, in this environment? Um, it definitely looks different than usual, but we were offering whatever services that we can that are safe to do so at this time. So the building is open regular hours for browsing and borrowing. So we do have people coming in. We're at a, I think it's like 50% capacity limit now in terms of people in the building. But for the most part, people are coming in going through the stacks. We do have computers available for the public. It's a limited number, but they are socially distanced. We allow for 45 minute time use. The idea right now is that visits are kept to under an hour, just it's kind of a grab and go um, mentality. So our, our public uh, meeting rooms aren't open. The study spaces aren't open as of right now. You know, I don't know, I don't really quite have a crystal ball to know where we're going with that, but for now people seem to be happy to be able to at least come in, browse for their own materials and take things home. And then they're using public computers for um, accessing resources and then they can print things out. We have people coming in using a copy machine, fax machine. Um, so it's kind of the non, we're not doing any in-house programming at the moment. We're doing all of that virtually online. So we, we typically would have lots of people milling in the building on any typical day, but now it's really people come in, they grab what they need and they go home, but they're happy to be able to do that. And you know, we not quite sure when it will change, but I anticipate with things opening up that we'll be able to do some more once I know a little bit better of what that would look like for us. But um, right now we're just operating on a, you know, we're open to the public, we're here, we can help you. And, but you just can't stay for too long. Uh, but a lot, right. of your, a lot of your Zoom programming have been very successful though. Right, you're right. We're doing, we're doing programming on Zoom, both for kids and for adults. So Ms. Teresa does story hour and she interacts with the um, children and families that way, doing book shares, we do our book club. And then I've offered sporadic, um, like monthly other programs for adults, similar to what we would have had in person. A presenter will come in and um, talk about any particular topic. So last month, for example, we had Ted Reinstein do a virtual uh, tour of New England for folks. So we're still, we've tried to recreate what we would have done in person as much as possible in the virtual Zoom environment. Great. Brian, did you want to say something? Yeah, a quick question for Jamie and then maybe uh, look to Todd for uh, another related answer. 
Um, Jamie, I know a lot of libraries will try to do used book sales throughout the year to, to make a few bucks. Uh, might not be a ton, but you know, I'm sure you've come to rely on it for some things over the years. I mean, has COVID impacted your ability to have some of those book sales or people maybe aren't as comfortable to come in? And would that be considered lost revenue? We could potentially, if we could look back over the years and say, normally we get $2,000 a book sale and this year we got 700 because people weren't comfortable. Is that something you typically well, do? The, the book sales here, yes, do are, are something that's typically held and provide the funds, actually the friends put on the book sales and the money uh, goes towards the friends. Okay. And the friends support both you know, museum passes and programming for the library. So a lot of the children's programming and all the summer program events, things during school vacation weeks, like I said, which we have a few things going on in the Zoom environment, they will sponsor those programs. So we're not planning for a traditional come and browse book sale, but the friends do have an ongoing book sale room that's open at all times. So when okay. we're open and people can go in there and browse for used materials and they make a donation at the desk. So as far as revenue, I mean, I, we probably have less people taking advantage of that just because there are some people still that don't feel comfortable with going out to the public spaces, but it's still something that's happening. Okay. But where the money goes to the friends, maybe that would make it difficult for us to qualify that as lost revenue then. Right. Yeah. I mean, the, the only, <laughs> yeah, the only lost revenue, I guess, would be um, a decrease in fines. You okay. know, there's less borrowing and less people, you know, keeping materials. And, you know, there was a window there while we weren't open that we, you know, we extended due dates and things. That would probably be the only real lost revenue from our end. Okay. Awesome. Thanks for uh, setting aside my curiosity there. Um, Jamie, I have a question for you because I think I've met with you more outside the library than inside the library this year. Um, wasn't this the year we were going to get the new printer? Is that correct? Or am I in the wrong year? That happened already last year. It was, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was discussed at the last budget meeting and then it was done I don't know, sometime in June. So it was like last fiscal year. Okay. But um, like I said, we have, you know, a lot of, it just haven't been there. So just so weird. <laughs> okay. Um, Ruth and uh, Nancy, did you want to um, say anything about the, um, the library? Ruth? No, just uh, I, I credit Jamie with, being very creative and keeping things going and keeping people's minds on the library and, and letting them know that we are open and we have programming and we have um, just what makes people comfortable. Uh, Jamie didn't mention, but we are still offering curbside pickup, which is nice for um, people who are totally uncomfortable going into public buildings. And that's that's helped a lot, I'm, I'm sure. One thing that I would add is that in 2020, we would have celebrated our 15th anniversary of opening. And due to the COVID situation and the man state mandates and the closings, we did not. And just recently in January, mid-January, we put in an exhibit in Jamie did a lot of work on the exhibit that f focused on what was going on in the last five years f from our 10th anniversary. And Ruth uh, hung the exhibit and did a wonderful job with that. So, but typically we like to have birthday cake and we knew that people were hesitant about food unless it was individually wrapped. So we have postponed, we postponed our exhibit until January from 2020 into 2021 and we're postponing our birthday party cake part until we can actually get people together sometime we hope this year and there'll be a birthday cake and we'll celebrate the fact that last year we should have had our 15th um, birthday so that's something to look forward to in 2021 cake okay anybody else have any other questions 
Okay. Um, I guess, Nancy, before you go, I don't know if you want the library trustees to uh, adjourn. Yes, I would like them to. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. I'll, second second? That. I'll second that motion. All those in favor? Rich LaCamera? Aye. Oh. Bruce Gross? Aye. Nancy LaFave, aye. We are adjourned. Thank you very okay. much, Board of Selectmen of FinCom and Chief yes. O'Brien and Lake Cam. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks for all your work. And Todd, too. Yeah. Thank you. We're leaving. Whoops. Thanks for that. There we go. All right. So um, next on the uh, the agenda here is to uh, for the uh, police chief, uh, Matt Perkins, to, um, to give an overview of, um, of his budget. So, uh, chief. How you doing? Thanks for having me. Um, my budget as presented represents a 2.96 overall increase from last year. Uh, the majority of that increase is contractual um, increases um, on the salary side. Uh, the increase is 3.44%. And on the expense side, you'll see a reduction of 1.38%. Um, those dollar figures, the overall do dollar figure is 66,301 increase from last year. Um, the only things that are in there that aren't contractual um, is a needed increase in overtime. Um, I, I'm suggesting a $10,000 increase in the overtime line item uh, specifically to target uh, the problem that we had in 2020 on Long Pond. Um, if you remember, we had over 100 incidents out there. Um, a lot of the residents were complaining about jet skis and trespassing and stuff like that. And we, we didn't have uh, enough funds in the budget to um, fund the patrols. When I did the budget uh, last year, um, I aimed towards the weekends. Uh, we saw a problem because of COVID, nobody had anything to do. So they were out on the water all the time. Um, and it wasn't just on the weekends. It was like after work during the week, people would put jet skis in um, and we had uh, a lot of problems out there. Um, so that is, you'll see that increase there. And then um, an increase in sick time. I increased it by 3000. Um, I think we need to change our mentality here on how we approach people using sick time. Um, in the past, it was always like people coming in, if they had the sniffles, uh, they'd just work through it. Now I am encouraging people, if you have the sniffles or any type of uh, an illness, use your sick time and don't come in. So kind of promoting that to keep everybody free of any um, COVID or anything that could spread through the department. And then the last thing is the, uh, it would be a creation of a new line item uh, titled town details. I don't have an account number or anything like that. And uh, just a minimum funding of $1,500. Um, and that would be for um, like elections. We had a problem during the election season this year where I was taking people uh, officers from the road to work the polls uh, by, by law. You have to have a police officer at the polls um, usually we, I pay for it out of my overtime account. Um, but there was some times where nobody wanted to work it. So when nobody wants to work it, I can only fill it with my full-time police officers. Cause I don't have, um, an avenue or a way to pay anybody else. If other details come in, we could have a, you know, a special work it or, um, a sheriff or a police officer from another town, but I just wouldn't be able to pay them. So this new line item, just at a minimum funding, would at least allow me um, some way to pay um, a special or a reserve or someone from another town a detail rate um, for, the, uh, for the polls. Um, I think that would solve the problem. Um, and then that was it. There was a, you know, a, a major reduction cut in half on the heating fuel line. We, we didn't really know um, what the expenses were going to be at the police station. Now that we've been here a full year, um, I've recognized that the heating fuel line of $6,000 is, is uh, too high. So we cut that in half. Um, and then we noticed that the irrigation 
um, was more expensive than we initially thought. So I had to increase that by $2,000. But the expense side is uh, a savings or less 1.38% than last year. Um, do you have any specific questions or anything? G5, two, if I may. Um, and we've had discussions in the past, and I apologize for not remembering, but you're, you're 130000 on the overtime. Does that get you into a comfortable position where you don't have to move people around shift to shift anymore? Yeah, we're finding that that, that works where I'm not bouncing someone's shift. Um, we're not at a point where I'm replacing every shift, though. Um, that would be, a, you know, a lot more money. So I have three people who are scheduled to work on a Tuesday night and one person calls out sick or one person um, takes the day off. We're usually not backfilling it. Uh, we do backfill on the weekends up to, um, you know, the three, three uh, staffing, but uh, we don't go below minimum staffing of two. Okay. And my other question, it's not so much for the chief, but $8,000 for irrigation yearly, um, where you guys are, are near the parks. I mean, have we ever investigated whether we could tie you into their system now? And that's just a general question. I know, um, you know, we've got parks and inspectional services later and DPW, and maybe they could answer better, but there was conversation about doing that in the future. Okay. We would say that and, and Brian, the, uh, the line uh, is already in place underneath that parking lot. Oh, good. To do it. It's a matter of uh, connecting it up um, to it's right on the other side of the fence there on the soccer field. So, um, <laughs> That definitely can uh, be looked at and uh, was discussed in the past, but hasn't been planned at this point. All right. That'd be great. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Uh, Finance Committee? Uh, no. I mean, everything looks reasonable to me. Um, expenses coming down is always a good thing. So, no. Good job. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Leah, did you want to say anything or? Um, nope. I just, again, want to thank the entire police department under Chief Perkins' leadership. It's been one heck of a year. And uh, I know that uh, you all did a lot of work out on the water this past summer. So um, hopefully it was an anomaly because of COVID that people discovered jet skis and boats. Um, uh, I think I did have a conversation with the chief that, you know, they found that um, with their counterparts in other places, that it was a trend in a lot of places. So, you know, hopefully that will calm down, but with the extra overtime, it will be nice. People did complain that there wasn't enough patrols out on the water and um, things are always much calmer when the boat's out there patrolling. So it would be nice to be able to get that out there. So um, let's hope it's good. Okay. Anybody else got any other questions or? But Rich, um, oh, I I'm sorry. There's one more thing. You're right, Tyler. I know what you're going to tell me. Yep. Okay. <laughs> the, the police cruises. Matt, do you want to talk about the two replacement? Thank you. Sure. Um, so I did the capital uh, redo for five years. Um, if, if you notice, or if you compare to what we've asked for in the past, um, that it's kind of a substantial increase. That's due to the industry standard. Um, they got rid of the, if you remember, the cruises have changed. The old Ford Crown Victoria was the old go-to police car. Then they moved to the Ford Interceptor. Um, and what Ford did is they ended up changing the Interceptor um, to a different style. So you couldn't transfer any of your old equipment over. Um, usually we would just take the light, light bar, put it on the new car, take all the, you know, the cages that are inside the car, put them in the new car. Now it doesn't fit because they changed, they changed the design. Um, that led a lot of people to go to Dodge and they were doing Dodge charges. Um, now Dodge is backlogged. You can't even get them. So we're seeing that the demand and the price for cruises has gone up. Um, we've, when we had the old five-year plan, it was, it was like way off for two cars. I think we had budgeted like 72,000 or 78,000. I forget what it was, but um, it wouldn't have been enough. And it leads us into problems of, okay, we're going to have to trade in a car or trade in, you know, a newer car just to get more money to afford a new car. So I think if we just have the base and, and this is what other municipalities are going with, 
um, 50,000 per car. And then when we trade something in and we get a credit for it, I think that'll just be a savings that that'll go um, back to the town when we don't use that, all that funding. Um, and it just, it just leaves us room to um, purchase what we want and what we need. Can you talk a little bit about the, uh, the policy then the procedure that you follow that, you know, you run a, if you look at the five-year plan, you're pretty much, you know, two cruises a year. Um, I mean, you know, if you want to explain why that is having to do with mileage and wear and tear or whatever on those cruises. Yeah. So we're still testing the new, um, the new um, Ford Interceptor SUV and finding out how much, how many miles we can get out of it. Um, when you, when you put a lot of miles on a cruiser, it's not like miles you put on a, on a regular car. They're like wear and tear, heavy braking, um, and they start to get loose and they're not as safe. So when they're getting up to, you know, 150,000 miles, they're just not as good anymore. So they, cut, they last only, you know, a few years, depending on how you use it, how you cycle it through, how many offices you have assigned to that car, what the car is used for, when you you know, take it out of a, a patrol and it becomes a, a spare cruiser for just, um, you know, details or something. So we're trying to figure out the best way to maximize the life of all the cars that we have. Um, we, before we were on, it was like every three years we were getting three cars. Um, and I changed that this, this year. Um, we got three, so I'm hoping that we can stretch this out to FY26 to get three then. Okay. Um, one of the things to, to point out, and uh, we're a green community, and um, a lot of times over the years, the uh, police cruisers would be used for town cars and so forth. And uh, because they, they don't meet the mileage requirements anymore, um, instead of using them for town cars, as the chief points out, they're really being traded in and out. It's unfortunate, but we can't use them. And that's just the way it is, so. How many cars do we have at any one time? At any one time between marked and unmarked or just marked cars? Uh, I guess both. Um, right now, 14. 14, okay. And they average about, you said every two, two to three, or three to four years, they need to be replaced? Um, so we, we, our fleet right now, we have a lot of, uh, 2017s, the ones that are going to be replaced. So it all depends on usage. Um, I don't have it in front of me as far as the years of every car. Uh, if you want, I could pull that up. Actually, I think it's in the back of the, the booklet here. Yeah. I, th I think, I think it's in here. That's fine. Thank yeah, you. It is. Yeah. There's a section in the back that has, uh, all the town vehicles listed there as far as mileage and years and so forth and so on. Yep, in, in the appendix. Yeah, thank you. Anybody else got any questions for the chief? I do. Okay, Larry. Uh, chief, how are you? Good. How are you doing? It, it was uh, nice to put a face uh, to the voice. Um, thank you for taking my call some time back. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, your preference to vehicles for the uh, you know, either the Ford Explorer Interceptor or switching to the, uh, you know, the Chevy Tahoes um, in the uh, purchasing process that you go through for the vehicles? Right. Because it's so new, um, the Ford Interceptor now has three different size engines. They have the regular and then they have like a turbo. Um, I don't think we need like a turbo or anything like that. Um, if you notice, we did pick up a pursuit rated uh pickup truck. So if, I don't know if you've noticed, we have a, a pickup truck that's mocked that's out there on the day shift. That seems to be functional. We use it to tow the boat. We use it to, you know, um, transport bulk evidence. We use it to transport prisoners too. So we're seeing that that pickup truck um, might be something that we go for next year. It would be within the capital plan. Um, but the Ford Interceptor is good too. So I'm leaning towards that. I was thinking we could go towards Dodge, but everybody um, has gone towards Dodge and they're backlogged and they won't, they won't uh, guarantee any delivery um, dates on Dodge. So I'm, I'm looking at Ford, either Ford SUV or Ford pickup truck. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay. Any other questions for the chief? Okay. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Okay. 
The next um, one is the uh, fire department, and that's in the public safety. And that's, uh, make sure we got the right pages here. That is uh, Department 220. So we have uh, Chief O'Brien on, and um, um, Chief, would you kind of want to give an overview of your uh, budget, please? Sure. Thank you for having me. Thanks for this opportunity. Uh, starting on the um, the salary side of the budget, there is um, some contractual obligations, but there's also a um, an adjustment in the second half of the next fiscal year of uh, manpower staffing uh, with the, the addition of two firefighters. Uh, we've been fortunate to this point to have those positions funded by federal dollars, uh, CARES Act money, uh, through the advocacy of our, our selectmen, and, and uh, you know they, they battled for that money, and and we've been fortunate enough to get 18 months of uh, almost 18 months of salary out of that that program, which is significant. Uh, the needed adjustment to the, to the staffing levels. Basically, we're averaging about a 10% increase in call volume per year for the last 10 years. So it's just the natural progression of things. We have uh, an above average aged uh, population and we have some, you know, some decent growth in town. And so there's increased demand for our services and, and that's reflected in the manpower request in this proposed budget. On the expense side of things, it's, uh, it's level funded. Um, one of the things that I really like to do is to analyze, um, analyze expenditures, analyze um, what we're doing as a department, looking back and make predictions about the future. But if anybody that you know that's listening is familiar with the fire department, I've had haven't had a routine year since. Everything's been an anomaly. Everything's been a, an outlier. So it's very difficult to to analyze my budget and and look for efficiencies. Unfortunately, I'm I'm looking forward to that. Believe me, um, to have a normal year and to really gauge where, where this budget should be. So there's really not not a lot going on except for that significant change in, in the number of firefighters in the second half. Um. You know, once again, the uh, fire department has had a very extremely difficult year and uh, they've done an amazing job, you know, as far as the staff is concerned and so forth. And the temporary firefighters that were added has uh, provided, you know, additional additional staffing levels uh, from a support standpoint. And it's really worked out well. And the chief's done a, done a great job, you know, in that area. Hey, you got any questions? Go ahead. Sorry. One of the big things too was able, we, we used to utilize floaters, which meant a firefighter would work from multiple groups. And with those, those two additional firefighters that we put on, we were able to isolate our groups. And so when we did have a, a positive case in the fire department or an exposure, it was isolated. It didn't spread like wildfire through our department. You know, we had two people sick instead of five or six. Uh, so that, that measure taken on early really may have um, made a it really did make a huge difference for us operationally. Okay. Anybody got any questions? Uh, Chief, one quick question, if I may. Um, and this might just be due to how the employees have changed since last year. I noticed the, the education went down about 21%, said one less degree to pay. And then the training incentive also went down about 43%. Is that just simply due to the makeup of the department for the next coming year? Changing or yeah, exactly that's just demographics. The, uh, we have a very young department and we have a very senior individual about to retire who has a degree and has a lot of training uh, certificates. And so with him, you know, it's just the, it's just a calculation of what I have on hand and, and whom, who's employed by us. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, you know, while, while I have the floor here for a second, I do want to say thank you to you and your department for just endlessly every single day, this last crazy calendar year going out and doing things you probably never thought you'd have to do as a department. Um, you know, you do have a young department and, um, I have to say they've all stepped up, they've all proven themselves. And I've been really impressed with how they've kind of come together under your still relatively new leadership and really wanted to prove themselves and be held accountable and go through training. And, you know, you're really doing a good job at, you know, that, uh, you know, grow from within mindset. So thank you for really pulling everybody together and, uh, you know, showing a lot of pride in that building. I really appreciate it. And it's a, it's a credit to their character, really. Um, I remember having a meeting at the uh, COA when this all, when the COVID thing started to ramp up. And in my mind, I was, uh, I was sincerely nervous that I would lose my call firefighters. They're not, 
they're not, uh, they don't make a lot of money doing that, doing that job. And, and there's a lot, you know, we didn't know what the level of risk was at that time. And uh, I think the message I sent to him at that time was, um, you know, if we get through this, you guys are going to all have a great story to tell your, your kids how you were, you were on the front line and you, you handled this, this situation, or you're going to have to lie about your role in the situation someday. So I kind of like kidding around with them. Like, this is something that you can never, uh, this is something you'll always be proud of in your, in your lifetime that you, you, you know, you rose to the occasion and you responded. So it was, I was very nervous and, and, and to their credit, they, they stuck it out. Um, I would, no, I would just say the, the budget certainly looks reasonable. Um, and maybe Rich, you were getting to this. Can we talk about the capital plan a little bit? Yeah. I just want to mention one th one thing that the chief really did mention. Um, he has spent, the last six to nine months, putting together a vaccine program. And he trained all the staff, his staff, to do that. Now, they have done the first responders, which includes the uh, fire department and the police department. And uh, uh, they were ready to go on February 8th to have our own clinic. And the goal was, was to have the clinic locally so we could deal with the uh, seniors and the shut-ins and, and so forth and so on. And um, the day before we were supposed to have that clinic, the state decided that local boards of health, and I want to also credit Ed Cullen, our board of health agent too, him and Mike uh, really worked hard on this thing. All of a sudden they said, we're not going to get any vaccines. Now, every week since then, we have uh, submitted, you know, to the state to get vaccines to at least try to uh, do the shut-ins. And we have identified the COA and Mike and Ed have, uh, have identified at least 62 seniors that need to have this vaccine. And the plan was, was to have the ambulance, you know, go to their house and actually vaccine that, vaccine the, uh, the seniors. And unfortunately, we haven't been able to do that. And they are still trying every day, you know, to, uh, to do something about that. And we've just been told uh, today, and I know that both the chief and the Board of Health Days have been working on this for a while, that it looks like we may join up with uh, a program that may be available at uh, Bridgewater State University that I think is going to be run by Brockton Hospital. Mike, I don't want to say it wrong. Uh, it's it's going to be run by the university, but Brockton Hospital is going to be involved in there yeah. somehow. So anyway, so that would kind of help, and maybe that will give us the opportunity to get some of those vaccines that we could do some of these shut-ins. But uh, um, it's been a challenge. But took these it took these guys – hours, weeks to put this program together. And I know I'm disappointed the chief is. And I want to thank the chief and uh, um, Ed, Ed Cullen, our Board of Health agent, for doing that. I'll accept, accept that, that thank you on behalf of Ed and, and, and the department. And, and one of the things that if you're watching this, uh, this meeting, everything we do, there's a, there's, uh, there's a lot of indirect people that are involved in, in, in how, how we roll out our, our mission whether it's the police chief, whether it's uh, Ed Cullen or the town nurse or the selectman, for everything to have gone right for us this past year, there's, it's, um, it's really the, the, the collaboration of so many departments and so many elected officials. Um, it's, it's gratifying to be in part of a group that's all pulling in the same direction. And um, it, it, uh, it's, it'll be something I'll never forget. It's been great to be part of this. Uh, Leo O'Brien, did you want to say anything and add to that, or um, I'm just I, I'm just going to say that you know my thanks goes without saying, but you know um, the chief is is a great chief, but if any once COVID's over, you owe it to yourself to meet him in person. He's got a great sense of humor, which has helped all of us in town hall get through this COVID crisis. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, with, with regard to the, the vaccine um, situation, I mean, Rich is right. The, the hours that, you know, not just the fire department, but the board of health and everybody else and, you know, the parks being willing to chip in with the lodge um, has been outstanding. And, and folks don't get to see all that in the background, what goes on on top of doing their day jobs. Um, I mean, this is just going over and above. I mean, what, what does at least, you know, give me some, piece if I have to look for something is the fact that if we do get the opportunity, everybody's trained up, everybody's ready to go, they're going to just pivot immediately and be able to serve our residents. So thankfully that 
preparedness is already in place and you know we get we get the opportunity they'll be ready to go i um i kind of equate it to um you know if you're a sports analogy you you know you were put out to to do a job you started the game and and you know whatever it is football you carry the the ball all the way down to the end zone and then they take you out of the game at the last second and it's tough not to be emotional about it but you know or be angry and and uh lash out but i mean you have to be disciplined and, and like you said be ready to jump in when, when they call your number again. Okay, uh, let's go to the uh, capital plan. Um, we can talk about the equipment side. I'd like to wait for uh, Nate Dowling, his inspectional services, and he may show up in between, but uh, to, to talk about the, uh, the building renovations. So, uh, Chief, do you want to talk about your request for uh, equipment? So, item number one on the capital plan is uh, – is a, it's not a replacement ambulance, it's a, an additional ambulance. So our ambulances and our EMS services are on track to generate about $916,000 in revenue for the, for the town of Lakeville. Um, it's really important that we have two ambulances in service at all time uh, because of the demand for our services. So what my plan is, is to, to add an ambulance to our fleet, to have two active ambulances equipped and ready to go and have a third reserve ambulance that will be put in during times of uh, when, when one of the ambulances breaks down. Um, the, you know, I, we've had situations twice in, in my short tenure where we've had to borrow ambulances and we actually bought an ambulance uh, for a dollar with the agreement that we'd sell it back just to fill in these gaps. It would be very gratifying and uh, it would be in the public's best interest to have a, an ambulance sitting there ready to go. And, um, and, and that's what my plan is. And basically it would be a, a four year, a four year rotation. So we'd get about uh, 12 years of life out of an ambulance, four years as first run, four years, as second run and four years as, as, uh, as a reserve piece. And that's actually probably about two years longer than, than what we've been getting out of the, uh, uh, an ambulance right now. So just having that reserve ambulance and, and beginning to share the, the workload between three ambulances instead of two actually, allows you a little bit of an of a increased lifespan for these ambulances. Any questions for the ambulance? I'm sorry. Um, I, don't think, I don't know if you recall, but uh, Todd mentioned that uh, we're going to borrow this money to do this, and we've already been borrowing for a current ambulance that's going to be paid for, you know, as well. So trying to get into this routine of doing it every four or five years um, is something that, you know, should be done. Okay, so who, Brian or Darren first, and whoever? Uh, go ahead, Darren. No, Brian, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, I was just going to say, I, I thought the chief was pulling my leg one of the first times I got to talk with him for a while on, you know, like Leah said, he's got a great sense of humor, and he's telling me, you know, it's, it's very common for our first ambulance to roll out, and then it's like people are at home listening to the scanner and suddenly have fear of missing out, and then like another medical call comes in, and I've kind of like been paying attention since then, and He's right. Like, it's ridiculous the number of times you'll see a Facebook post where, like, both Lakeville ambulances is sitting next to each other at the hospital ER. Um, so it's, it's I, I, I don't know what it is about this town, but you're right, Mike. I mean, both ambulances seem to roll out at the same time pretty often. Having a third would be nice to have one ready to go. And, and speaking to that, having ready to go, this, um, this cost reflects the you know, the, some of the staple equipment in, in the ambulance. So it wouldn't be just the ambulance, but, but the cardiac monitor and, and all the, the, uh, the integral things that, that we need to make sure that am, am, ambulance is serviceable. Um, I'd love, I'd, I'm sorry, Darren, I'd also like to add that um, we have, uh, we're part of the mutual aid and Lakeville is quickly becoming um, very reliable to other towns for their mutual aid. So that also speaks to uh, the chief's leadership skills too. There's a lot of moving parts to this. I mean, I, I mentioned the revenue number and the willingness of our off-duty firefighters to come back to the station and staff our second ambulance is, you know, is, is, is great. And, and to make sure they have an ambulance there to use, uh, it's just all these moving parts to make sure we can carry out our mission. Uh, we have a very dedicated group that that come in on callbacks day and night, uh, you know, three, four o'clock in the morning and to have a functioning ambulance there ready for them to, to answer that next call, as as Selectman Dave mentioned, um, is is just it's kind of all the pieces to the puzzle. Darren, 
Yes, I actually had two questions. One you already answered. It was in regards to the additional cost of furbishing the ambulances, which you said are included in these figures. Um, the second one, so um, what additional revenue would you project based on this, this new ambulance? You say we have 900,000 now. Is this a couple well, hundred thousand? Do you have an additional one or? Well, part of the difficulty in analyzing our numbers this past year, um, we, we were told by our, our billing contractor to expect a down year because of actually, actually like reduced demand for EMS services related to COVID. People were, were nervous about going to the hospitals and we didn't see that. So I'm, not, I'm wondering, if, were they wrong or we would have seen a bigger bump in revenue and more demand for the services? I, I don't know what the answer is to that. Um, I, I, and we've been fortunate this year where we haven't lost, uh, we haven't had a, uh, we haven't lost one of our first or second ambulances um, due to due to malfunction. So I, I don't think it would be a significant bump in revenue. Um, but you know, when we're seeing, you know, we saw uh, we're we're projected out seeing about an eighty thousand dollar bump in revenue from from FY twenty to FY twenty one. So you know, these are, you know, we're we we're, we're seeing a sharp incline, and in, and in the the driving force behind all that is all these little things that we're doing well. Um, we have a very, uh, Lieutenant Grant is a very aggressive uh, quality control officer. Where she demands that the, the reports are written um, correctly and the quality of the report translates into better billing. Um, we submit our reports within a few days of the incident taking place. And, and that's that increased uh, responsiveness uh, increases our, our revenue that we derive from that report. So all, there's all these, um, is five or six different things that we do all that, that all creates this, uh, this increase or this increase in revenue. Uh, just as a reference in 2018, when I took over, uh, we did about $500,000 in revenue annually on, on uh, a slightly less call load. So, you know, we've, we're really, uh, we're, we're um, pushing all the buttons to get the most out of the, every run. We, we understand that we, it's our responsibility to, to decrease the, the burden on the taxpayer as much as we can. And, and that's how we view our revenue. We want to maximize it so we can, we can uh, be less of a burden on our taxpayers and, and perhaps even parlay that into better services for them as well. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, I didn't, wasn't able to give you a, a number figure, but. No, that, no, that's fine, that's fine. I was just trying to get an idea of, you know, additional revenue based on this um, ambulance, but I know this is an unusual year as well. So maybe in a couple of years, we'll have a better idea of the actual numbers. Okay, I look forward to that. <laughs> um, oh, you want to go into the next piece, the record management software? So one of the problems, um, somebody, I'm not sure I'm quoting somebody, but they said you can't, manage what you, you can't manage what you can't measure. And the existing records management software that we utilize in the fire department is very bare, bare bones. The reporting is terrible. It's very difficult to do queries. Um, so again, to analyze a question or to, to run a query on our data, is very difficult for me. So we have a, a separate records management system for our, our, our EMS record keeping, and it performs very well. I can find out a lot about what we're doing on our ambulances and how we're performing. Uh, so they also provide a fire records uh, management uh, software, which I'd like to move to and have uniformity between the two basic functions of our fire department. And one of the, the, the nice one of the great things about this, this new records management system is that it has a bridge or it's, um, it basically uh, is able to speak to the police department's uh, computer aided dispatch system. So now we have, we'll gain all those efficiencies from all the mouse clicks and, and the recordings that are going on at the police department during dispatch. All that, all that information basically passively gets, gets downloaded into our fire records and our EMS records. And so it's a time saver for our, our, our caregivers and our firefighters. They're able to complete their documentation quicker and, and, uh, and get a quicker turnaround on these calls. Anybody got any questions on that? Okay. Uh, next is, um, I guess, the inflatable boat. The infamous inflatable boat. Don't laugh. <laughs> Don't laugh. <laughs> Um, one of the, I came, the fire department that I worked, to, worked for previously, we were on an island and we were in the middle of Narragansett Bay and we had this 12 foot inflatable that we did more rescues with and it was just about response times. It was 
it was a light boat that we could pick up, throw in the water. We had a small motor on it and we could intervene before somebody went under the water. And, and we're like a dive rest, a dive team is more about recovery and the success stories are few and far between. The, this thing is about interceding at the, at the very, you know, shortly after the incident and saving lives. And so when you look around Lakeville, you see so many smaller bodies of water. Um, this boat will be able to be put in at, you know, at, uh, at Loon Pond and, and it'll be able to be, you know, Elder's Pond. It'll be able to be thrown into that, those ponds and respond quickly out, but it will also be able to serve Long Pond and Assawamset as well. Um, so it's really a, a, um, a very uh, fast reacting uh, platform and it's very flexible. And it, it's basically, this boat represents a big gap in our mission because you, you know the police department has a boat and, and the fire department has a whaler and they're kind of redundant. They can do the same things. This boat is, is something that can really uh, make all the difference in the world in a water rescue. Anybody get any questions? I was just gonna ask the chief uh, real quickly too. I mean, with the inflatable, I mean, not even, I mean, it's still water, it's a different form, but even this time of year, I mean, you can throw that thing out on top of the ice too, right? And you know, drag it out there and not have to worry about falling through. That's, uh, it's absolutely used that way. And it's, uh, it's lightweight. And, um, and the nice thing about having the boat as a nice rescue vehicle is that you have somewhere to put your victims. Um, you get them up off the ice and out of the water instead of dragging them you know, bouncing them across the ice, you're putting them in the boat and you're kind of retrieving them. Because if you know anything about hypothermia, the more you you uh, disturb a person and shake them around, the more likely they'll go into cardiac arrest. So it's actually better for the patient as well. Okay, anybody uh, got any questions? Um, uh, we're gonna be talking about the, uh, the building in a few minutes um, after we get uh, done with the highway uh, director, so. Anybody got any questions on this capital items? Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, you want me to stay on and, and mute? Uh, we're going to go back to the to the building when Nate comes on? Yeah. In about 15 okay, minutes. You. Okay. Uh, probably less than that. 10 minutes. Thank you. Mike. Okay. Uh, next, we have the uh, Director of Public Works, uh, which includes the Highway Department and the uh, Transfer Station. So uh, Frank uh, is on the is on here, I believe. Yeah, I'm here. Okay, hi Frank. Hi. All right, so that's in the uh, public works uh, section, and that is um, uh, Department uh, 420. Um, so um, uh, Frank, I. I uh, I'd like to kind of give you give an overview of the budget, you know, where you've come from in the last couple of years and reorganizing the highway department, you know, as far as staffing levels are concerned and also uh, taking over the uh, parks. Okay. So do you want me just to really go through the lines that have some changes to them? Is that what we're trying to do or? Well, I think, you know, maybe what you want to do is kind of talk about some of the staffing things and what you, we did over the last couple of years and what you're doing this year to, you know, not only service the highway department and uh, service the park commission, and then we can talk about um, maybe particular line items when we get there. Okay. Um, yeah, so over the last couple of years, we've definitely made some significant changes. Um, we've... Uh, Got a full-time HMEO, which is my equipment operator uh, laborer position that was once split with the parks. I took that over um, full-time for the highway department or the DPW. Um, we also uh, most recently um, hired a uh, full-time laborer for the parks, um, which is actually paid out of the parks budget. And along with that, we put out a full-time HMEO, which is another equipment operator, laborer for the parks, which that has been very difficult to fill. Um, that's been, it's still an open job um, that uh, I've been working with Clarinda, um, really trying to get it filled, but this year has been tough for trying to, for trying to get good uh, employees as far as filling that position. 
which that would uh, be working along with the laborer in the parks, which would be two full-time um, positions, which would then cover uh, all the parks in town at that point, which would then free up a lot of my uh, DBW highway guys that are now working in parks and, and gives them opportunities to work on other things. Um, we obviously, we promoted Jim Lucas up to uh, deputy director. Um, most recently, um, last year I was promoted up to director. Um, we are also looking to hire now, which we'll talk about when we get into the budget, another laborer, which would be taken out of, um, I guess we can get into more of that, but there's another laborer, which would be specifically for the DPW. Um, as of right now, we have no laborers. We have uh, the six, um, basically HMEO, heavy equipment operator, um, truck drivers positions. Um, so adding that laborer, which basically we have a 20 hour guy now that works year long. Um, so it would, he, he's interested in the position already. So it, it'll be a very seamless transition and um, it'll definitely be a, a, somebody who can kind of take on a lot of, a lot of the grunt work, I guess you could say, um, keeping my guys in equipment and in, in machinery during, during the year doing um, what they're skilled at. Um, and then moving forward, we're looking to get another full-time seasonal guy um, going into the parks, which would cover clear pond and, and jump around to John pond, things like that. Um, basically I've seen a big, a pretty big increase bigger than I thought I'd see for, for manpower. And what it's allowed us to do is cover a lot of areas that, you know, some, some areas we were already covering, but we weren't really doing, um, everything in these areas where now we're doing all the tree work. We're doing, um, basically covering all outside of buildings everywhere in town, all public owned land, um, which we were doing, but on a much smaller scale, I guess you could say, um, prior to all these changes. So when we get to park, you know, um, like uh, Frank said, you know, that he has taken over all of the, uh, the maintenance for the parks, you know, outside the buildings and, uh, uh, his, his, his staff has done a terrific job there. And um, recently, this past fall and early winter, he spent a lot of time down there with the highway department cleaning up Clear Pond. So if you went to Clear Pond now, you would see that there's been significant improvement to, in uh, not only cleaning up what's there, but cleaning up the trail that exists at Clear Pond that wasn't, hasn't been utilized in years, and also cleaning up the trail, you know, at Ted Williams Camp. So uh, that's that's a big improvement, and uh, I know I'm pretty sure the park commission is happy about getting those things done. So, anybody have any questions uh, from uh, Frank? A quick statement, if I may. I, th I think this is a department that um, you know Frank is not one to toot his own horn or his department's horns, but this well, this one's almost one of those departments where it's immeasurable to calculate the actual cost savings to the town that they generate over the year. Um, the staff over there um, always amazes me with, you know, their skill sets in body work and general repair and welding and everything else that a lot of towns don't have. We're lucky to hang on to them. And if we actually, you know, in the future had the, the time to sit down to, you know, calculate the hours that they work on all of our equipment and look at what a, you know, an external rate would be, or every time they jump in a truck and go fix a firefighter that's on the side of the road that needs something, I mean, the money that they're saving us probably, you know, damn near pays for itself. Uh, so I just want to say thanks to, you know, to Frank and all of his crew. You drive by, you know, their yard and it looks like it's full of all brand new equipment. It's not. It's mostly used stuff that they've gone and bought at a great price, brought into the shop, turned it around, painted it, fixed it, brought it back to looking like new. And, you know, the town can really be proud of what's in there. Um, so I, I don't know how we measure this in the future, but, you know, it's, it's not lost on me how much you guys are also saving us in addition to everything you do for us. Uh, I, I'd like to just add that, you know, people just always assume the roads are going to get plowed, that the potholes are going to get filled. And I mean, there's some really good, hardworking people doing that work under, you know, Frank's leadership. And um, 
I've actually in the last few months been getting calls, text messages, Facebook messages, people saying things like, you know, wow, the park looks great. Or, um, you know, wow, the plows were out early or people notice, they really do notice. And that's my job as a selectman is to sort of, you know, listen to the townspeople. And I, I got to say right now, there's a lot of happy people and they're noticing people even notice the day that, you know, you had some folks out there cleaning up trash. I mean, you know, there's a sense of pride that, that it just, you know, comes from, from your work, Frank. And that just, you know, goes to who you are and, um, and it shows and people, people are noticing that, that there's a lot of good work going on. So um, much appreciation for that. Okay. Uh, anybody else got any questions? Does anybody have any questions on his expenses? They're pretty much the same, you know, from last year. How are we looking on snow so far, Frank? I know the year's not over. March could be tough, but. Definitely already into deficit spending, um, which is, Typical. Uh, That's fine if it's not in front of you. I'm just curious if you had a, a gut feeling. I think Todd uh, can answer that question. Yeah, I have it here. I'm just, uh, Todd would definitely have a better idea on years past as <laughs> far as where we are to, uh, you I, know, I can... um, where we're at now to where we were, um, That's all right. where we've been. Well, we're definitely into deficit spending. I can tell you that. Um, Which for the folks that we've used up a lot this year, so that was definitely a huge expense. But that's kind of how it goes when you have a lot of these wet storms that then freeze overnight, and then you're kind of out there salting a lot, even when it's not snowing, because you get rain during the day and then freezing temperatures at night, things like that. So. Um, and for those at home, deficit spending, we have to do that in order to get any reimbursement from the state. So it's not like we didn't plan properly. <laughs> I don't know if you or Todd want to explain that for anyone who may be interested. I, Todd, I do want to play it, Todd. <laughs> <laughs> Pass it to Todd. Oh, thanks, Todd. Oh, um, we, we do have currently have a deficit in the um, snow budget this year. It's very modest at this point, uh, you know, hoping that, that the weather stays favorable for the balance of the season. Um, we will be um, wanting to chat with the finance committee about whether we deal with this through a reserve fund transfer to correct the deficit or we'd prefer to bring it to the special town meeting in May. Um, I can tell you that we budget just typically just over $100,000 a year. Uh, that we did increase for FY21. Prior years were more like 50,000. And um, over the last 10 years, we averaged spending about 210,000 a year in snow removal, snow and ice. Um, so there's certainly an interest in the part of the town's administration to look at raising this budget when we have an opportunity to um, certainly not to any crazy level, but um, we, we do need to supplement this budget. This budget has been supplemented every year uh, for the last 17 years, and I don't have data handy prior to that. So we clearly go into the year with a structural deficit in this area. So it's certainly something that the current administration uh, would like to um, correct when there are up budgetary opportunities to do so. Okay. Thank you both, we appreciate okay. it. You all set, Brian? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, um, so let's uh, go to the transfer station, which is under the enterprise. Where is that? That's uh, yeah, toward the back of the book, and it's uh, the fourth page in. The first three pages are the park enterprise, uh, and the last two pages represent the uh, transfer station. Thank you. Uh, 
Okay. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about that. It's uh, pretty much the same, but been you seem to be doing very well there, you know, as far as revenues are concerned and expenses. Um, uh, we are going to have to uh, uh, put together a new um, contract for trash because uh, it expires on uh, June 30th. Um, and I know that um, Frank has already got uh, uh, three quotes and um, I believe it's about a five or 6% increase over last year. Um, but overall, the uh, transfer station budget, I believe, Frank, is in pretty good shape. Yeah, yep, there's really not a whole lot of changes as far as the uh, landfill budget goes coming into this uh, year. Um, and all in all, we're on a pretty good track um, as far as the revenues go this year. And um, which is kind of surprising considering we were closed down for a while and then we were limited hours for a while with the COVID. And um, but I think a lot of people may have spent a lot of time at home. So they were bringing in a lot of uh, a lot of different things. Um, it, it's actually been pretty steady, pretty busy. But as far as the budget itself goes, there's really not a whole lot of, of changes. And it's going to stay pretty even. Anybody got any questions? Okay. Okay. So let's go uh, to the capital uh, plan. Um, uh, Nate, are you out there? I am. There you go. Welcome, <laughs> Nate. Nate Darling, um, Director of Inspectional Services and Facilities Management. Um, one of the things that uh, I know that uh, everybody spent a lot of time last year was uh, trying to address the uh, the office at the highway department, which is a which is a problem, and um, unfortunately, because of COVID nineteen uh, and the cost, you know, of doing that building, uh, we weren't able to do that. And I I don't want to speak for Nate, but I believe that we're in the process of the architect is in the process of working with uh, Nate and uh, Frank to draw those plans up so we can get going on that building. Is that correct, Nate? Yeah, that's that's correct. Um, we're gonna we're having plans drawn up. Uh, Frank's done. Um, what do you'd like to see for a floor plan? Uh, we've taken site plans. Um, they got to get drawn up and, and gone out to bid. Okay. Um, so the money's been appropriated already. <laughs> it's actually been appropriated a couple of times. <laughs> um, so uh, hopefully this summer we'll get that uh, project uh, moving and completed this year. Anybody got any questions on that project? Uh, one quick question. I don't know if, if any of us will know, but I know one of the big drivers of all the construction prices going up last year was the the tariffs on uh, Canadian lumber. And those, I believe, were dropped from 20% to 9 or 10% at the end of last year. Do we know if we've seen any, uh, any drop in construction since then, or is it still pretty high for materials? It's actually still going up, Brian. I Ugh. got the numbers last week. It's, it's, it's doubled. Um, so, you know, an average uh, sheet of plywood that was $22 is, you know, 45 right now. Wow. Steel is going up as well. Yeah. What was that, Darren? Steel is going up as well. All yeah. the material, building materials are going up. Okay. That's too bad to hear. So we'll have to see what happens here. Okay. Um, any mails can questions on that uh, building before we go into the capital plan for the highway? Okay, so if we go into the capital plan for the highway department, um, do you want to give an overview of what you're looking for um, this year, uh, Frank? Sure. Um, so as always, every year I put in the same number um, just because the chapter 90 money really just doesn't cut it. Um, and I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't ask for it. So I put in for 375 uh, 375,000 every year for, um, road work. Um, that's just kind of, that would just go towards our pavement management and get an extra road, probably two miles of road done, depending on the processes we use or could use depending on the road we choose. Um, the next item would be the skid steer with equipment. Um, just stop skid you one second, Frank, oh, just so yep. everybody knows, uh, we got a letter, right? Actually, uh, I think I put it in your box. 
that uh, we're going to get four hundred thousand dollars of uh, Chapter ninety money, you know, coming. So just so you know, yep. And that's what he primary has been using for. You see the the uh, you know the pick the uh, Precinct Street and the Highland Road and the, those roads have all been done, you know, with uh, Chapter uh, ninety money. So it was was Frank's actual request three seventy five for FY twenty two, and he's getting one fifty, or yeah. is the yeah. yes. What? Okay. Um, and I, I touched on this last night when we talked about an overview of the plan. Um, this is what we believe uh, the town can afford with our available funding for next year. As you, as you look at the five-year plan, you see we've, we're still um, showing a contribution of 375 in the next two years, up to 400,000 in the third and fourth, uh, fourth and fifth years. Uh, but right now with our sources of funds, Unless there are items here on the capital plan that come off the plan, we may be able to increase this, but this is what we uh, believe the town can afford. And we do uh, confirm what Franklin's trying to do, that we can't pay, you know, keep all, maintain all of our town roads simply with the state chapter 90 funds. It, it will be interesting to see if there's an infrastructure bill somewhere along the way, now that we're, we're spending trillions of dollars, right? What's another trillion? So. Uh, that would obviously help the situation. <laughs> no kidding. So Frank, with that reduced number, I mean, do you still have specific roads in town you'll be able to do come, like to the level you'd yeah. want to? Basically, yes. Um, any, every, every little bit helps, I guess you could say, um, with the point that we're at right now. Um, yeah. All right. Because I know you had some roads targeted. And maybe the yeah. same one or two come off, but you'll still be able to do something. Yes, um, it put, it puts us puts me in a better uh, position for sure. And like I said, I, I usually don't. I put this number in. I usually don't expect to see it. I just put it in <laughs> something that you know I think I should be asking for to try to, you know, we need to get to a point where we're doing more, um, you know, road maintenance and, and um, doing doing more surface treatments and things like that more than doing like full reclamations or, or full. Um, mill and overlays and thing, you know, that stuff's expensive. So if you can get your roads to a point where, where you have the majority of your main roads in good shape, then you're spending very little money to keep them in good shape for over the long haul. Um, so it's, it's a long-term plan. Hopefully we'll see it one day, but yeah, every no, little keep, bit helps. That's for sure. I mean, I would say keep putting it in. I mean, we need to be aware of it. So, you know, keep asking, we'll keep driving towards what we can do. I agree with that. Okay, go on to the next thing, uh, Frank. Uh, skid steer um, with equipment. That's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a multi-use piece of equipment that we don't have. And um, I'm, I was kind of surprised about that. I had it on my capital last year, but I ended up pulling it back because I had to cut a few things out of there. Um, that with equipment meaning, um, so skid steer is very versatile. I can buy a lot of different attachments to it. The ones that I have set with this, with the 95K is thousand is a, is a grinder, which is, so when we're doing our patching, um, it's what, it, it's just basically a mill, a milling uh, machine that goes on the front of it to mill down an inch or so. So when we're doing these patches, we're actually um, doing more professional patching than what we're doing now is we're basically either jackhammering or cut jackhammering or cutting the, asphalt peeling everything off and then replacing it right back down which is um not not the best um as far as processes go um also we the other um piece of equipment we would be getting with it is a, a flail mower or like a brush hog which like we talked about with the parks so for one thing for like trails um cutting trails um getting into tight situations as far as that stuff goes you can't really bring some of our bigger equipment in there it gives us the versatility to do that. It also gives us versatility to work on in the tighter areas and parking lots and um, moving material in those type of areas, doing some grading and things like that. It's just a very versatile. Oh, and one other thing we can use it for is also plowing, um, getting into the, the same thing, parking lots, things like that, into the tighter areas, cleaning up, typically after the storm. Um, and then also for sidewalks that we do when needed, um, which is like the 105 sidewalks and things like that. So it's a piece of equipment that that's just some of the things that that um, our, our direct plan of using it. Um, but long term, there's so many different attachments and different things that that we could um, 
use it for us all the time. Um, you know, it, we, we get those different attachments. Frank, um, when you are repairing the roads, right? I'm guessing over time, we actually pay more by repairing them than just replacing them, right? Is that fair? Like if, if we just bit the bullet at first, at, up front, we would actually save money. Yeah, over the long term, for sure. So, yeah. um, I mean, 79 is always my perfect example for that. Yeah. We just keep dumping money into it. Um, but just to keep it safe, because we have to keep it safe. Um, so hopefully when that project gets done, but it goes for the same thing with a lot of these roads. Um, but yeah, yeah, absolutely right. Because it's not just the materials, it's the manpower. It's um, the, the nighttime calls because balls open up during storms and we got to get in because they're blowing out tires or whatever it may be. Um, but yeah, that's, so we want to get to a point where, like I said, we're doing more surface treatments and things like that. We're not really cutting into roads or, or dealing with these roads that are just continuously opening up on us. Every storm after the storm, we're going out, we're spending days filling potholes. Um, and then it snows again, we go out, plow again, we're back filling those same potholes or doing the same patching over and over and over. Um, right. I think it's important for the residents of the town to realize that, that um, we're actually spending more by delaying, by delaying these, the inevitable, so. It's a great point. Actually, Darren, one of the things that Todd and I have talked about with Frank is that, you know, looking at borrowing some money up front, uh, mm -hmm. let's say a million dollars, just use that as an example. Uh, because when you look at the cost of money right now, I mean, the town can get, I don't know, what do you think, Todd? Probably it's ridiculous. It's like 1-8%. Yeah, yeah well under 2%. Yeah. And so that, that should be a consideration to look at. So your point is that, you know, we can fix some of these roads quicker instead of waiting every year, because as you say, as we wait every year, things deteriorate, which means more maintenance and so forth. So I think that that's something that uh, should be looked at in the future. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Okay. Um, the other two items, I guess, uh, Frank. Uh, yeah. The uh, mower, which is actually, this is, this will be the second mower we purchase of this, size it's a six foot deck um the one we we just purchased was going to be primarily for the parks um which is replacing a, a mower and really old uh mower that was there um so this is another duplicate of that mower which will then be used also in the parks but then it can be uh utilized in a lot of our open space areas like betty's neck and um things along those lines it just gives us more versatility with a bigger mower and, and i mean if put it into perspective we're using like a four foot typically a four foot deck at betty's neck um we don't we do the trails there it's three passes on every trail um obviously you just set a six foot deck you're doing two passes which you know over a, a summer that cuts back on a lot of time and a lot of manpower um and gives us time to do other other jobs around town okay the last item uh frank uh, the bud permit material, that's uh, been an ongoing thing. Um, I don't want to get too much. In, that's a long conversation as far as the bud permit goes, but that's catch basin and sweep of material that was stored on the uh, highway department back property there. Um, it's like a mountain. If anybody's ever seen it, it's basically a mountain of catch basins and, and, uh, and street sweeper cleaning, you're not supposed to store that on site. So that caused a big problem. We're now at DP. Um, we're using a bud permit, which is a beneficial use determination through DP. Um, and it's right as of right now, if everything goes through, it's supposed to be going to Maryland's Landing, which is basically a fill place. We'll be paying to get rid of it there. Um, so I have some money remaining now on a old on a past capital item. I think I have maybe 16 grand left on that item um, to, to get rid of this material. Um, and this will just give me another 25 to get rid of more. And then next year I'll be back here again, asking to most likely for more money again to continue getting rid of this material. They deemed it uh, contaminated material because they found asphalt particles and things like that in the, in the material. And that's, uh, it's, 
it's, uh, I won't get too much into, I don't want to get too much into that because it's, uh, you know, but either way, so we're stuck trying to get rid of this contaminated material. Um, that's what that cost is. Okay. Anybody else got any questions for uh, Frank? Uh, one, if I may, not related to capital, I just came to my mind. Um, Frank, I think it was you. I apologize if it's not, but were you the one that was kind of helping go through and um, normalize a lot of the contracts we had for um, like fertilizer and everything else around time around time. We narrowed those down to a, a smaller number of providers now. So I, I'm basically going off of the one particular quote um, at this point, but it is added into my budget under the highway department budget. Um, it was added, it's added this year, which is going to cover um, fertilization the four-step program, um, mulch, and irrigation, which is another thing that the DBW has taken over this year for all the town buildings, which we hadn't done prior. Um, and it was added in here. It's, uh, I don't know, four or five, uh, yeah, four, five down on the expenses line items for a $12,000 number. That okay. covers um, the library, the old library, old town hall, council on aging, and town hall and police department. Nice. Okay. So you're, you're getting that consolidated down so we don't have a, a baker's dozen of contracts out there anymore? Or? Yeah. So ideally we'll have one um, one company doing all of it um, okay. rather than everybody kind of doing their own thing. And then we can actually hold one person accountable. So when things do go wrong or things aren't done correctly, and, you know, I got to call Nate who I know is here um, to go into the because something wasn't blown out the right way or whatever it may be. And then as I increase in manpower, like we talked about, um, that number over the years will probably go down because then I'll have my own guys doing a lot of this stuff, um, you know, as time allows. Nice. All right. Yeah. Appreciate the efficiencies. Thank you. So, Brian, when we talk to the uh, Park Commission, uh, that's one of the things, the, uh, the fertilizing in their budget, you know, which is about $17,000, I believe the number is. So uh, we want to consolidate that into uh, – and to Frank doing Frank Frank doing that as well because right now that's a separate contract. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Thanks, Frank. We're all set. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Thanks. Okay. Um, now that we have uh, Nate here, before we talk about his budget, um, we want to talk to uh, Nate and the fire chief. Uh, chief, you still there? Okay. I'm here. All right. So, um, as you know, uh, last night uh, we talked about um, the proposed plan to um, take over the old, the old historic library. And um, just in a very short period of time, there's been significant improvements over there. It's amazing uh, how quickly, um, you know, it's been demolished. The inside has been demolished and painted and so forth and so on. And I explained the plans as to the handicapped bathroom and the, the handicapped ramp and so forth and so on. So the plan is to um, move the, uh, the Board of Health and all of inspectional services, you know, over to that building. So I don't know. We emailed you the plan. I don't know if you guys printed it out. No. The fire plan? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, Finance committee. I think we emailed that to you this afternoon. I did not see it. I don't know, um, Larry or Adam. I have it. Oh. I, have, I have it as well. Okay. I see it right now. I'll take a look at it. Yep. Okay. Anyways, so uh, what the chief did was um, try to take the space, uh, the first floor space. And then the second floor space as to how he wants to configure the areas for the fire department. And uh, as I'm sure most of you know, um, there's some uh, serious deficiencies, you know, in the fire department that uh, we're trying to address on a short term basis. So um, I don't know, um, Chief, if you want to talk about the areas and what what we're doing and uh, what space we're taking and renovating to make it. Um, a little better, not 100% better, 
but at least uh, provide some uh, good office space and uh, areas for the fire department. Okay, thank you. Uh, starting on the second floor, which is the, uh, the floor plan to the right of the, the drawing, uh, where it's labeled deputy's office is currently um, conservation and chief's office, that's uh, my current location. And just outside there is a, an improved training area. Right now there's um, a bunk space in there, there's cabinets and, 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 and file cabinets. And what we're trying to achieve here is to have a, a, a meeting area for our firefighters and have a training area. There's a lot of uh, EMS training and things like that that we're gonna get done there. And it's also space that'll be available to the rest of the town hall as well. Uh, to the left of that, we have the kitchen um, and that's gonna get an, a, a very, uh, it's going to get an overhaul as well and uh, provide it with new paint, new floor. Um, this whole second floor has this uh, torn up, buckled uh, carpeting, and which is also going to get uh, yanked up and replaced. When you get into uh, the office's room, basically that's going to be a report area. That's going to be a place for uh, line officers to meet with the subordinates, a little bit of private space, and we always need a storage area. The administrative uh, section there is where Annette works and that's where she works currently. And it provides her with some, some uh, privacy and some, some uh, better use of her space as well. So currently we have one bunk room, one small bunk room up here, and that's gonna be uh, replaced and moved down to the first floor. So moving to the first floor uh, plan over here. You wanna, um, mention, wanna mention the deputy's office, Chief? Um, you mean uh, the conservation area? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, basically, uh, we when I first was hired here, we had uh, we the deputy shared space with actually uh, the parks uh, administrative assistant, and it was a very kind of a difficult situation when we had any kind of sensitive material to cover. We had to kick her out of the room. Um, so this is a much better setup for the deputy chief, where we have some private space and an area to 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 uh, do his job or her job in private. Uh, is that what you want me to, to address? Yeah, just to mention that the deputy chief was going in there, yeah. Yep. So going down to the first floor, if you look in the alarm room area, it's the existing alarm room currently, and there's an existing bunk there. And what we're gonna do is uh, close out the end of that area to provide some additional privacy. We have, um, I think currently we have six females who work for the department in some capacity. So it's important that we have um, provide them with, uh, with, with all our firefighters with, with private uh, sleeping quarters. Um, um, it just goes with the territory. So not a lot of changes to this room, uh, just an improved configuration and a cleaner space. We're gonna knock some counters over to uh, create a, a good flow of traffic. We're opening up the hallway and we're proposing to, to, to use existing bathroom space over there. Uh, it's, it hasn't been used in a while. It's actually currently being used as a closet. Uh, we're putting in a door at the end of the hallway just to create a more secure location and control ag access to the fire department and what is currently the um, the vestibule going into the the health department will be our primary entrance our main entrance into the fireplace a uh, fireplace excuse me fire department uh, as you see the area labeled as public if there's business that can't be um, taken care of at that window in the vestibule we'll invite them into the public area we'll also have a window it's difficult to see in the plan uh, going from the day room to that public area so we can see, uh, we can kind of see what's going on out there and if anybody needs additional assistance. So a day room is kind of a multifunction room, you know, traditionally in the fire department, it's, it's kind of where we, um, we meet uh, the shifts as they're going out the door, they exchange information, we provide report to each other. This is kind of the heartbeat of the, the location. This is where the, where um, kind of the meat and potatoes of our operation. One of the things that we don't have in currently is we don't have a shop uh, area. We don't have uh, a space to work on our equipment or maintain our small engines and things like that. So this workshop storage is actually our current day room slash dining room slash bunk room. So, I mean, to when I say it that say that way, that that's that space currently is our bedroom, our living room, our kitchen. Um, that'll give you a sense of what the conditions are currently and what a big change this will be in, in the uh, configuration of the fire department. So, I mean, this is a temporary fix to a problem, but it's a significant improvement and I'm, I'm definitely happy about it. Um, and you see the gear room. And, and what I want you to notice is 
is our apparatus is parked to the left end of this picture, this, this drawing. And when we're coming back from these COVID calls, we're coming back from structure fires, we're contam we're, we are contaminated. We have products combustion on us. We might have um, a biohazard on us. And as you progress into living quarters, what, what we do is we peel off our gear. We can be, you know, we, we strip out of our gear. We drop off things. We have the gear washer position out there. We have the gear dryer position out there. And we basically don't enter the living quarters of the fire department or even into the town hall until we've been made clean. And uh, that's another significant improvement. And that's health and safety. That's not only health and safety for the firefighters, but everybody who operates in that building. So, I mean, this is, uh, I mean, this, this little bit of domino effect of, of inspectional services moving to the library really has paid big dividends for the operation of the fire department. And it, and it isn't a nice thing. It's, 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 it's not about nice or convenience. It's about mission and it allows us to do our job a lot better. And, and I'm pretty happy about it. I'm pretty fired up. So is there any questions about what I, I covered? Do you Mike, if it's okay, chief, sorry. Um, yeah, but First of all, I mean, it's amazing to see the amount of detail that's gone into this. And I completely understand you guys are trying to work within the confines of what that building has to offer. Obviously, there's a lot of walls and such that can't be moved in there. Uh, I had a, a couple items. And as I've told you know, yourself and other department heads, you know how to run your departments. I don't. So I can sit here and armchair quarterback and it doesn't mean anything. You guys know how to get your job done. Um, so my first question was, um, generally, how often does the public need to come in and you know, who would they interface with? Would it be administration? Would it be somebody else? What, what is the most common need of the public? Prior to COVID, the most common need was permits. Um, it would be burn permits, uh, propane permits. It's uh, anything to do with construction or fire prevention was the most common interaction. Sometimes it's uh, records requests. And what's incredible is um, with our online permit, and the, you know, the permitting system that, uh, that Nate uh, configured and allowed, allowed us to, to jump on. We've, uh, we've been able to conduct business remotely with a lot of these people with no, no drop off in service. And, and I think it's gonna stay that way long after COVID kind of goes away. So after this, it's, it's basically maybe some few people that aren't tech savvy, um, uh, we might have some delivery services, but I think the traffic coming into the, into the fire department is gonna be considerably less, which is, which is a good thing, I think. Okay, so my, where I was going to lead with that was whether or not it made sense to have um, administration kind of abutting that vestibule window. Like if that would be the person they would normally interface with or not, maybe they don't. Um, that's why I was kind of asking just to understand how it works. Um, then I'll let you answer point. that first. It's a good point because my original plan had uh, my administrative assistant down in that area and, and she pushed back and she made a valid point that she's handling a lot of confidential information that that and you know it speaks to the, the reconfiguration of her space. She has more privacy. There's ambulance reports. There's uh, records requests. There's a lot of uh, there's personal records. There's a lot of confidential information that probably shouldn't be in a, in a common area like like down in the in the day room. Well, I was, I was going to ask you know would it make sense to have administration down there and then the day room upstairs where you know the you know you get some of the other stuff going like the kitchen you know because I look I'm like it looks like we've got a stove. Yeah. Top, an oven, but no sink in the day room. So they're going to have to carry dirty dishes upstairs to the. There's the actually sink a or... sink. We're going to repurpose a sink from the library oh. uh, <laughs> and uh, put it in the <laughs> shop. Uh, it's, a, it's a great, it's, it'd be a shame not to repurpose it. It's a beautiful sink. Um, and there's a whole, basically, the kitchen is kind of, um, it's, it's like twisting arms to get them to use it. Um, so that's the idea of a. Uh, small kitchen down, down in the, the day room. And I won't get into the whole nuts and bolts, but there's, you know, there's backstory and context to every, every uh, little situation in the town hall, but there's this backstory to, to my firefighters resistance to using that kitchen, which I won't get into currently, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave it. Right. That's fine. And then um, what was it for somebody that doesn't understand how, you know, a fire department works, given that you guys now have dispatch also being by handled by the police department building. What is the the modern usage of the alarm room today? I mean, does that stay? Does that go? What what rolls through there? Well, what the benefit is, and we're not a PSAP, we're not a, a we're not a configured to be a nine one one center, but there is redundancy there. We can we can um, we can run radios uh, for the PD through through our our dispatch area, um, and currently we're able to lessen the load on the the police dispatchers because it's very difficult to dispatch for for both agencies. 
Um, if we get enough sufficient staffing, we can put a, a person there on the desk and run the fire side of, of all the emergency dispatching. So it relieves the load for them. Gotcha. All right. Thank you. And then uh, I think final question here is the bathroom and shower on the first floor. Um, you know, if I'm showering and I realize I forgot my rubber ducky, I mean, do I have to go and walk through an open public hallway to get back to my bunk room to go get that? And well, we're a close bunch now. <laughs> um, they, um, it looks there's, like there's no changing area in there. <laughs> no, no, that's, that's going to be, so the shower, the shower area is actually going to be at the bottom of the page. Um, I really don't know how that space is going to get used. That's one of those gray areas that might get shed this, the under the stairs bathroom area. Uh, it's nice to have backup and, um, and you'll see less bleed over. You won't see firefighter personnel using the, the bathrooms and the rest of the walls often. Um, but the, the main showering area is down in this bathroom, just just uh, just uh, next to that that rear entrance. And that's the existing shower and bathroom area. It's just going. The plan is to to make it a little bit nicer. It's pretty decrep decrepit right now. It's 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 kind of gross. Nice. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to see the day room somehow, and I, I know that's kind of kind of be the the department's you know. I don't want to call it the hangout area, but let's just call it that for the moment. But where that is in the first floor, I mean, it'd be great if that kind of turns into a semi ADA accessible, you know, meeting room for the town, if we need to bleed over somewhere. Well, I mean, it, eventually that would be a great use of the space. One of the things that we do badly um, as a fire department is we do, we're, we're slow getting out the door. If you, when I, when all our radio transmissions and our dispatches are all time stamped and marked and recorded. So if I get a fire, uh, the one thing I do is I download the tapes. We do an after action report and I timestamp when the call was received, when the first engine signed on scene and, and, our, and our, our gold standard or what we try to achieve is from the time the 911 call is made to, ha to have somebody out responding to the call in less than two minutes. And we don't really, we're not, we haven't been hitting that benchmark quite a bit. And part of it is because of the configuration of the space. And so by me putting people the bunks downstairs and the day room closer to the apparatus is shaving time off of that, that turnout time, whatever we call it, it's turnout time. Um, my goal is to, to turn out, have a turnout in less than two minutes every single time. And, um, and getting people close to those fire trucks is kind of my way of hoping that happens or trying to make that happen. Okay. Um, one of the biggest things that slows us down is you kind of, you've been in the, our structural stalls, you have to navigate through the trucks and, and kind of bob and weave to get through there. And, you have to crawl out of the station because of the lack of space on the inside of the trucks. So it's, we have a lot of things working against us. It's not just the positioning of the firefighters, but if I can save five or 10 seconds uh, from them having to come down the, all the stairs and, and navigate through the day room to get to the stalls, I'm going to grab that, you know? All right. Awesome. I appreciate you giving me the time. And like I said, this is where, you know, you know how your department runs. I don't. So thank you for explaining it to the layman. Um, Brian, one of the uh, discussions is what to take, Nate's office and make it a uh, conference room, which would be fully handicap accessible. You know, that space. And that, that actually used to be a conference room <laughs> in the town office building. So I'm going to get you out of there then. <laughs> okay. <laughs> hey, anybody else got any questions on the plan? Yeah, I do. Okay, go ahead then. Uh, hi, Chief. How are you tonight? I'm doing great. How are you? Chief, I, I'm looking at your plan and it, it you know, obviously you're, you're trying to make uh, something work here. Uh, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't notice any apparatus floor here in this plan. Is that a, is that because it's in a different spot on this plan or so, where's the apparatus floor sit in this? <laughs> you, do you see something labeled GD? It's called the, it's a gear dryer yeah. and you see those emblems on the lines there. Yep. Um, that, that means it's uh, the building continues. We just didn't include it in the drawing because there isn't any, going to be any significant change to the building over there. Okay. And, and so I guess um, th this plan, I, it, I've heard several people say that, you know, it's a temporary fix. It's a temporary fix. Where does this take you into the future? Is, you know, as fire, you know, the, the fire industry, changes and uh, equipment changes and more technology and, and larger equipment and larger apparatus. Um, where, where do you see yourself? Does this, does this plan get you five years out? Does it get you 10 years out? It's one of the things that it does not, it, it addresses our, our living conditions. And, and when a building opens, I, I, I would welcome you, welcome the opportunity to, to give you the grand tour of the place. Um, it addresses those, 
those living conditions. Um, one of the one of our one of our uh, recruits, some, uh, we had a person apply, and she and she ended up actually being the valedictorian of the of Mass Fire Academy. Excellent, excellent candidate. Uh, she actually turned the job down after after touring the facility because she just couldn't picture herself, um, you know, working in in that space. So it's it's to say it's a disadvantage um, when you're competing with other towns for personnel is is an understatement, and and it definitely affects our our turnover and it affects our morale um, a bit, and 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 worse than all that, it, it affects our ability to function because we had to overcome some of these risks for, we had to take extreme measures with COVID to overcome this limited space that we were dealing with. I mean, that workshop areas, our kitchen, bunk room, day room, everything was into that space. Um, so it's an improvement, but looking forward, there's so many, um, so many more improvements that are needed. We're buying fire apparatus based on what will fit in the station, not based on, on need or mission. Um, so, you know, if we're, if we're making, you know, strategic decisions about fire apparatus or making strategic decisions about uh, resources based on need, um, the building's kind of cramp, cramping our style. It's, 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 uh, it's, 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 it's limiting in, in, in what we can do and, and, and how we can change the mission to suit the need. Um, um, Larry, what we talked about last night was doing this feasibility study. And that's probably going to take at least a year or maybe longer to, to finish that thing to talk about, you know, what the options are and approach. So, you know, if you look realistically and you say, OK, we're going to do something, you're talking at least between three to five years by the time you have a bid and design and so forth. So um, the goal was to here was to try to help the space in the short term. But we all know that this is not the long term solution. OK. Yeah, that was my concern is that it sounds more like they need a new firehouse. And, and, you know, we've heard many times how inexpensive money is right now to borrow and maybe that's the place we should be looking. Um, but um, no, I, I, listen, I, I have the utmost respect for, for the chief and his, and his, and his staff and his, the department and all firefighters and EMS included. Um, and they should have, great living quarters really because that's where they spend most of their life so you know i have no problem with it i just you know, i just want to make sure it's enough for them that was my I, point i really appreciate that um and and believe me i i'm you know i i wanted a new station yesterday um uh, <laughs> but, but that's the kid in me the the adult in me says that it has to be done right and and we have to really really analyze what we need and, and where the station needs to be and then even even the logistics involved in and how to build a new station and house our existing operation. You know these trucks have to be in climate controlled areas. They can't be left outside or in the cold. There's so many variables that have to be addressed to get us to that new station. That this is kind of the acceptable bridge to get us there. This relieves a lot of the strain on the department, and it's kind of like the smart way of going about you know trying to do what we're, we're, we're aiming to do. So I think we're all pushing in the right direction. We're all pulling in the right direction. We all want a, an improved fire department. And, and I guess this is the kind of the right way of doing it, in my opinion. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Um, Mike Nolan, we're probably about 15 minutes behind, just so you know, okay? No problem whatsoever. Okay. Um, next, we've got to talk about... Um, uh, Nate Dallin's uh, Budget Inspectional Services. So if you go to general government, we'll start with that one. Uh, Department 193, um, which is uh, basically his uh, maintenance department. Um, I don't think there's many changes, you know, in there. Um, did you want to say anything or provide an update in that area, uh, Nate? Um, sure. So uh, there, there, there really isn't uh, much of a change. The, the only, um, the only change, it's about $3,000. I added uh, a few more hours on our part-time uh, custodial staff just to um, add a little more, but there's, there's really no, no other things that are added on that, in that section on facilities. Um, okay. Um, does anybody have any questions on the uh, facility maintenance budget? 193. Okay. 
Let's go to uh, the next area, which is under um, public safety, and that's inspectional services and part-time inspectors, which is uh, 241 through 247. All right, so um, the only thing that I did there um, that's relatively significant is I added 7,000 uh, to the hourly assistant inspector. Um, over the last five years, I've worked hard uh, to get a few people certified as um, assistant inspectors. Um, as soon as they're certified, they get scooped up by another town uh, full time. Um, so I have a few more people that are going through the process now. I'm really hope hoping that I can get um, you know, somebody uh, to take a little bit of the load off, uh, you know, uh, this, this upcoming year. So the additional 7,000 will give me uh, $10,000, um, you know, to pick up some of the inspections and just kind of to put it into perspective, I did the analytics, the online uh, permit platform that, that Mike O'Brien was talking about. It's been a huge asset um, to just about everybody. I was just looking at it um, right before, uh, you know, when, when he brought it up during, during his presentation, he saved just the fire department per online permitting, uh, saved 500 trips to the firehouse for, for burning permits. But just so you, just to get an understanding of it, since July uh, 1 of last year, um, we did 2000 inspections um, between me, electrical inspector, plumbing inspector. So, you know, this will take a large burden off of that. So that, that was really all I added in in inspectional services. Okay, anybody got any questions uh, for inspectional services? Let's see, um, the Conservation uh, Commission pretty much is the, uh, the agent is pretty much the same. Everything well. stayed the same on there. I, I did have one error uh, on training, education and program uh, programs. It shows a hundred on what you have in front of you. It's supposed to be the same as last year at a thousand. Okay. That's the uh, train uh, commission members. All right. Um, the Board of Health, uh, the Board of Health Visiting Nurse, which is under um, Health and Services, um, which is the uh, pink one. And oh, actually, it's not pink. It's, it's orange. Uh, that's uh, Departments 510, 522, and 5, 510 and 522. Okay, so the the visiting nurse went up a thousand dollars. We we were able to get um, two five thousand um, uh, dollar grants uh, from the state, so it's kind of helped us through uh, this the, the the COVID stuff. But um, just in anticipation of, of uh, the spring and the tick season and um, communicable diseases in general, um, we've we've always been right there at the cusp. So I just added a thousand to that. Um, and then, Rich, you said the 510, the, the full Board of Health? I'm sorry. No, that would not, that's okay. Yeah. Okay. Because 510, the, the Board of Health stayed the same. Right. Okay. Um, so um, does anybody have any questions on any of these budgets? Um, once again, you know, uh, Nate and his department and this, the health agent, um, Ed Cullen and the nurse, these guys are working seven days a week. I mean, it's just unbelievable the, the pressure and the stress that's put in put on these guys because of COVID nineteen. It was just amazing, you know. So, yeah, Rich. The other thing, just real quick, if I can, I wanted to bring up the uh, gas inspector, plumbing inspector, and electrical okay. inspections. Um, so, so those that's under uh, two forty two, two forty seven. So uh, I had to, I increased those a little bit um, this upcoming year. Uh, for the last couple of years, we've had to do a, a transfer, um, you, know, right or, you know, right around this time of the year or, or, or um, uh, May. Uh, but right now we should be at about 66% uh, of our overall budget spent. Um, I'm a, well, actually a little bit more than that. I'm 85% I'm um, for the uh, electrical and gas. So, you know, we saw a large spike in construction. We have a, a 40R project going on, two 40B projects. Um, all of them are supplied uh, by natural gas. So we're seeing a, an, an awful lot more activity with uh, these sub-inspectors we, than we have in the past. So there's just a small increase, um, 1,000 uh, extra in gas inspections, eight, uh, 
thousand uh, extra in plumbing and two thousand um, in electrical. Uh, I do I do want to just uh, touch on the fact, and I, I ran these analytics as well. Is um, you know for the from the plumbing side of it, um, to year year to date we've spent eleven thousand eight hundred and forty dollars in in uh, plumbing inspections, but the revenue collected is twenty eight thousand. Um, so you know we when we're going up in these line items, we are collecting fees uh, to offset that. I just want to make sure that everyone's aware of that. Um, you know, building in, in general, uh, we've generated about uh, two hundred and thirty uh, two thousand uh, dollars worth of revenue, which would put us, uh, I think, in line at three ten three fifty uh, this year for for total revenue. Okay, um, Nate, do you want to talk a little bit about the? I forget what was it in the town office building having to do with maintenance of buildings? That seventy six thousand dollar number. How how you go about that approach now? about maintaining the stuff. Yep. Yeah. Um, starting from when, when it was, when it was started, Rich, is that what? Well, what you're doing now, you know, trying to uh, centralize, yeah. you know, all of the uh, buildings, repairs and maintenance stuff, you know, through your office, you know, using uh, the, uh, the head of maintenance there. Uh, yeah. so, so similar, similar to what uh, Brian and Frank were talking about, Frank's pulled together fertilization uh, mulch uh, in, in, in irrigation. Um, in the past, uh, all different departments had their, their own um, facilities. So we, we kind of separated that into uh, expected uh, facilities uh, maintenance and unexpected. So we took a pool of money, put it in, in one account, um, and then Todd created sub accounts so that we would be able to report on exactly where this money was spent. Um, Teddy uh, Della Rocco uh, has been an uh, integral part in assisting me uh, to get these projects done and maintain them, schedule them, uh, provide uh, access uh, to buildings, even in off hours, weekends, everything else. So um, he's doing uh, probably 75% of that right now. Um, he's you know running everything by me from a budgetary perspective, uh, but he's making the calls, he's getting estimates, uh, he's meeting folks on site, showing them around. So I think, um, I'd, I'd probably be lost, lost right now without Ted. Um, I th think that's what you were asking, Rich. Yeah, and also that you require that uh, everybody that needs something done, they put a work order in. So it gets reviewed and uh, determine what the estimate is and the cost and then uh, making sure that it gets completed. Yes, yeah, so, so we started that work request process uh, a number of years ago. It, it helped us um, analyze how many requests for um, maintenance work were being done. Uh, we also also use it to, um, uh, you know, for billing, for invoices. Uh, we sign off on them, however many hours uh, somebody's uh, worked. It goes right up to accounting, and they get paid off of that uh, work request. But it's a it is a great way to, you know, hold you know me and, and Ted accountable too for uh, department heads that are asking uh, for work to be done. It's it's all time stamped. Um, so it also with the the contractor, you know, we email those to the the contractor. Uh, they have a, a born on date, if you will. Uh, the department heads allowed to uh, prioritize whether it's at your earliest convenience uh, or you know emergency or, or as soon as possible type of scenario. Okay, anybody uh, got any questions for Nate? Be too easy on him. <laughs> That's late. <laughs> oh, well, I'll, you know, and also, you know, there's a bunch, not a bunch, there's, there's probably four or five projects that, um, you know, was, should have been done in 2019. And uh, we aren't able to do that. You know, we've got the roof to be replaced at the old town hall. It's already been funded. We got the roof to need to be replaced at Betty's Neck, which has already been funded. Uh, I know that Nate just started, uh, which has already been funded. You know, gener new generator for the town hall and generator for the COA, which never had a generator. Um, and some other repair, repair stuff. And, I did you know, write those down. Bill. Bobby this, Bill. This probably close to, you know, seven of those. And, and like you alluded to earlier, um, you know, when, when this pandemic hit, I mean, we were ready to go. And then, you know, June, we got more appropriated, more money's appropriated. Uh, but the highway department, uh, there's like, like you said, uh, peach bond roof generators, uh, generator ship date. Um, it, it's it's um, April 13th uh, of, of 21. So we should see those arriving pretty soon. 
Uh, the transfer switches for the generators have been backordered. Uh, we're seeing a hard, you know, we're seeing uh, it very difficult to get electrical supplies, transfer switches, breakers, things of that nature. Um, but these are all under contract, so we're not going to see a we're not going to see an increase in cost to us, which is good. It's just a delay in getting it. Um, we do have the historic townhouse chimney, uh, which we encumbered uh, two thousand three hundred and fifty dollars from last year. Uh, that's all ready to go. We're just waiting for the weather to break. Um, I wanted to kind of touch upon uh, Assawamset Elementary School, Rich, too, if we can. Um, you know, number of years ago, I believe the number, and if Todd Stilani, he can, he can correct me if I'm wrong here, I, I think it was $263,000 uh, total. So, so we did uh, two appropriations at town meeting, $100,000 apiece, uh, and then we did the last one of 60, 63000 I think, in 2019. Um, during that time, because of the, the you know, school operation, we were really only doing work during the summer, uh, but we did uh, a lot of flooring, painting, uh, exterior trim. Uh, Franklin helped me out. We did a whole lot of paving over there, line striping. Um, we added screens all along Main Street. None of the windows had screens. So when the teachers opened the windows, um, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the shoulder months uh, to get a little ventilation, um, you know, you get bugs flying in. Uh, we did a lot of electrical upgrades, uh, panel upgrades that were in the hallways, uh, unlocked. So we, we had those custom, uh, custom made to go back in the existing openings. Um, we've also uh, put almost $400,000 with the green communities money into Assawamsit um, over the last uh, five or six years. But right now we have uh, $47,637 left. Um, this summer, we're hoping to get back in there, uh, put our painter uh, in a couple more classrooms, get some fresh paint in there and try to finish up the flooring. So there, there was old two, two foot by two foot copper carpet tiles in there. I think they've been in there since 88 if I'm not mistaken, um, and we're changing those over to vial composite floor tiles. So we should be wrapping those up this summer. And I think what I, and Nate, you and I talked about this, that the stimulus money coming, you know, shortly, um, that there's an opportunity to uh, replace the uh, ventilation units, you know, in each one of those classrooms, uh, which I know has been on the capital list for the school. Uh, it's probably about five hundred thousand dollars to do, but that definitely would be a plus to to get that done as well. And I know that you're aware of that, and that's something we need to look at. You're, you're exactly right, Rich. The unit vents in the Castle Booze feasibility study it was around five hundred thousand. I talked to Greg Goodwin uh, the other day, and, and Greg's fabulous to work with. Um, he's got some updated numbers, and he's got some information uh, that he was able to compile through this current um, uh, performance contracting that they're doing at the region. Um, so I think we'll be able to get some pretty good numbers on there and, and, and it would be a, a big help for improving the uh, air quality in, in Assawamsa. Not that there's an issue there, uh, but we know that, uh, you know, they're all, it's an old system. So, you know, new unit vents, it, it would be incredible in that building right now. Okay. Anybody got any questions for Nate? No questions. Just as you said earlier, it's, Incredible how much you and all of your departments get done, given how busy it has remained through pandemic season. So you know, thank you for being there, even though sometimes that means seven days a week and seven days a week. Um, you know, definitely appreciate everything that you and all everybody under you do. So thank you very much. It's, uh, it's always impressive to see what does get done. Um, I just want to say, Nate, that uh, I know what you're saying about Teddy. Anytime I go in on at town hall on the weekends to pick up my paperwork and whatever, I know I'm going to see his car in the driveway and you just, that's incredible help that we have. So, um, and thank you for all your efforts too. It's just, it's been a tough year and you've been a, you know, guiding force for all of us with the department of health stuff and helping, you know, Ed, the, 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 um, uh, health person and, you know, Lori, the public health nurse, and it, it's just been a whirlwind. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I have a quick question Rich, sure. for, uh, for Nate. Hey, Nate, we spoke briefly about the office building at the camp. And I know it's not on the budget here anywhere, but um, we talked about the possibility of using some of that green community funds to uh, insulate that building. And, we're actually going to uh, we're actually going to talk about that, Mike. He's going to uh, stay on with us. 
Okay, great. We're great. going to talk about this capital. I want to ask him before he disappeared. Okay. No, he's, not, he's not going anywhere. <laughs> I'm chained to my desk. We need him. Um, if anybody has no objections, I just need one minute. I'll be right back. And Mike, if you want to, if you want to call your uh, committee to order, that'd be great. Nate, I'll drive by and throw some crackers through your office window if you'd like. Uh, I ran home and had a bowl of soup. <laughs> oh, good. All right. All right. So I guess we could call the, the Park Commission uh, to order uh, at what time is it? 8.13. Uh, members present are Joe Kosha, Paula Hool, and myself, the Vice Chairman. Uh, I don't see Scott Holmes here or um, Jesse Menford. So I believe we go after Franklin, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct, Frank? Uh, nope. I believe you guys are up now. I win uh, 7 o'clock. Oh, Thanks. Good. Yep, Frank's done. I think it's just uh, the parks that's left, Mike. Fantastic. So um, we all know we all know that it's been uh, a very difficult year for the uh, the park commission. You know, certainly having to do with. Um, all the programs and stuff that had to be canceled and the events at Loop One Lodge and, you know, the revenues are down, you know, substantially <laughs> non-existent pretty much. Um, so um, hopefully going into uh, beginning in 21 and uh, July 1, that will change. Um, uh, we just heard today, uh, Mike, uh, you know, so we know uh, that, uh, the new stimulus money that was approved today, um, it looks like that they're um, going to allow lost revenue to be reimbursed. So we're hoping that that will help us all, you know, at least for the next couple of years. Um, they don't give it to you all at once. They give it to you over a two or three year period, but at least it'll be something. So we'll see. Uh, Todd already got information on that. We'll see how that all plays out. So anyways, so um as um, I guess everybody knows that uh, that we uh, went out for an RFP to uh, get a new company to uh, uh, handle uh, Loon Pond Lodge, and that that company uh, would take care of you know everything to do with event management, to uh, food service and and bar service, um, you know, for the Loon Pond Lodge, um, which I think is the uh, the right direction overall. I think we all agree with that now. And um, the company that's been chosen is uh, has been Boston Tavern. And I know that um, Lear is uh, working, you know, on the contract, you know, right now, you know, as we speak. Um, we don't have, I don't think she has all the answers yet. Um, and I know that she's had some discussions, you know, with, um, with uh, Boston Tavern. So, um, I guess some of the things that we need to um, we need to talk about is um, revenue stuff um, because it's difficult to um, uh, figure out exactly you know where you're going to be um, going forward. So um, I think one of the things that we I think we want to break it up into Clear Pond discuss Clear Pond, the expenses and the revenue associated with Clear Pond. And then I think we want to talk about, you know, Loon Pond Lodge as a standalone thing. And as you all know, and I hope everybody agrees that, you know, with Franklin and the highway department, you know, taking over all of the maintenance, you know, the outside maintenance of the facilities that everybody's happy with that. Um, I think it's going very well. I hope you guys agree. Oh, very well. Good. Yeah, that's good. Excellent. Yeah, I know. That I think, Mike, you had put together a list of stuff. Uh, I know that Joe did, too, and, and so forth. And uh, 
I don't want to say it's all done, but a good portion of it has already been addressed. And I think one of the areas that we all talked about was uh, Clearpoint Park, um, which he, as you know, I think he's done a tremendous job trying to clean up, you know, years and years of, of problems there. And I know he's worked on the trails, which everybody's excited about. And he's also worked on the trails at uh, the Ted Williams camp. So I think that that's great. So um, anyways, um, so I don't know, Mike, where you want to begin. Do you want to? <laughs> I was just thinking that. Where do we start? There's a lot here. Where do you guys want to start? <laughs> Let's start at the lodge, okay? Sure. Um, Leah, you know that um, we, we spoke and um, um, I met with Tim from Boston Tavern down there just to give him a feel of what was going on. And he explained to me a little bit about the, the uh, deal that he's worked out with you folks. Um, no, no management fees. I understand. So that right there will save the, uh, um, our budget about between 36 and $40,000. Um, he feels that he can manage that. If he puts a uh, full-time, a full-time person or full-time people down there, uh, they can manage those uh, without any, you know, he can do it without any management fees. So that's great. Um, and he just gave me, his idea of some ideas of what he thought that they would be able to generate. And even the first year where I believe uh, you guys are negotiating like a sliding scale, like 12%, 14%, 16%. Is that correct? I, I haven't actually seen the contract yet. It was, it was 12, 15 and 16%. Mike. 12, 15 and 16. Yeah. But even at 12%, um, if he can bring it, if he can book the amount of, um, of uh, events that we've had in the past, um, the uh, revenue should be pretty close to what they were. I mean, of course, it's all a guess at this point because it's a totally different system. But um, I'm confident that um, we're gonna see um, some significant uh, revenues coming from the lodge. Um, uh, he's very energetic. Uh, he has some great ideas of other things besides just um, weddings and, and birthday parties, such as uh, uh, like an Easter brunch and um, uh, uh, Christmas parties and stuff like that. So he's, I, 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 it was a very good meeting with him, Leah. I really liked uh, talking to him and um, it was uh, very optimistic about moving forward with him. It's very hard to determine what we're going to bring in for, for, for uh, actually bring in for, for, uh, Right. right. And, you know, Brian had some questions on their projections and, you know, it's hard for us, for all of us. Um, I don't know if we want to do the revenue projections from what the last best year was, which was 2019. Um, but I even the, the couple of the few times that I've spoken with him and his um, the head chef that he has, um, you know, we've had several cancellations come in. You know, I, I have not been the best event coordinator, um, although I'm trying. Um, but I feel that I just spoke with him again yesterday, just a couple of questions I had to ask him. And he said they're already um, having people that are asking them directly, um, you know, about booking events. So I have no doubt that some of these cancellations that are coming in are going to get rebooked, you know, right away. And that as soon as possible, um, you know, we'll, we'll be able to start having events there again and start generating some revenue for the parks department. Um, I do want to, you know, I, I was supposed to meet with Nellie yesterday and I, it, the day just got away from me, but I do want to, you know, shout out to Nelly, who is, you know, the assistant for the park commission, who has called a couple of people and clarified some stuff. She's helped me out. It's been great. Um, you know, it's just been a really tough time and there just isn't enough help right now. So we're doing the best we can, but I do think that they will book these events and they're going to do a pretty good job for us. Okay, a couple quick aside uh, questions about that. Um, the he mentioned to me that you guys were possibly working on a uh, like a one month contract. Well, so I did. Yeah, I did talk to the lawyer about that, and he 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 cautioned me. He said the best thing for us to do is 
to just do the contract and do it properly. So um, they also have a license that they're, that's pending that they're waiting for. So um, as much as I want them there yesterday, we're going to just have to, um, I'm waiting on the attorney to um, give me the return draft. I mean, I, you know, sent him all kinds of I mean, the original, the original management contract we had was a 21 page document. So it's, you know, there's a lot that goes in there. So, and we had some definite changes from the past. It's a definite, it's a different structure. So um, we just have to get it right <laughs> to begin with. Okay. So um, he, uh, so April 1st is probably an overly optimistic um um, yeah. he, he has it all. And I don't think I forgot anything in the first draft. So, um, I, I, I hope not. So as, as fast as I get it from him, I'll get it to, you know, the board of selectmen and to the park commissioners to take a look at it. And, you know, um, hopefully we can, we can do it quickly. Cause I know they're ready to go. Um, he told me he's ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's he's itching to get in there. Yeah, um, and I've already notified um, the martial arts studio that they need to be out of there by April first. Okay. So um, uh, we'll stick with that until we hear anything different. Yep. The other thing that he uh, asked me about and I didn't have an answer for him was, um, well, just to back up a second, uh, their plan is to use that kitchen. Yep. Actively use the kitchen, not passively use the kitchen the way it is now but yep. to actually cook the meals there in the kitchen. Um, I know, I don't know how much you guys are aware that there is some work that needs to be done there in the kitchen. Yep. Uh, he um, mentions yeah. I don't know if, if Nate is still with us. I think he is, but he has some, maybe you and Nate can get together and discuss some of the ideas he has for, you know, some of that, that work um, to get that work done. Um, but I know the, the guys from Boston Tavern, they're like, geez, you guys are so close. It really wouldn't take much to finish, you know, some of this. So, uh, maybe you and, and Nate can get on the same page on, 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 on that. Certainly. And he, um, indicated that he would be willing to pay himself for some of those upgrades. Okay. So I didn't know if that was a negotiation that you folks were doing or, um, talk to him about it or Nate should talk to him about it. One yeah, I, you know what, to be honest, I didn't put anything like that in the contract. So, okay. um, we'll have to, I'll have to talk to you and we'll talk to Nate and I'll ask the attorney how we should handle that. Okay. So the assumption is that the, um, the, the kitchen is usable. Yes. When we rent it. Yeah. And okay. they did tell me, he did tell me that he's okay you know, initially doing it catering style like it was before, but their their goal is to just get there and, and be able to use the full service kitchen. Yeah, Mike, and I think he, that... he, he, I'm sorry, uh, one thing, Rich. Um, he did say to me that the equipment that's in there is sufficient for him to do what he wants to do. Yeah, yep. Um, they, they were pretty, uh, from uh, what I understand, they said the equipment's pretty good, actually, so... Yeah. Kudos yeah. to you guys for putting together a great kitchen when the renovations were done. I guess the only thing, uh, Mike and uh, Leah, that's important to Nate right now is that if we need some money, we need to try to figure that out soon so we make sure that we have money appropriated to do anything. And I have no idea what it is. But so, um, you know, I would think in the next couple of weeks, we've got to get a handle on, you know, what that may be. So we yeah. could provide that, you know, that fund if, unless he's going to pay for it, which, you know, is a possibility, but so, yeah. uh, so. And, we, and I'm, I'm, I'm perfectly okay. Stepping away from the actual uh, working on the physical location. I, you know, would like to stay with a contract here. And if uh, we need to put something in the contract, I can certainly do that. But I mean, I can be an observer or a participant, but. I don't know what I can add to um, the discussion that perhaps Nate, Tim, and um, Mike couldn't figure out on their own, but I'll happy to participate if you want me to. <laughs> so, uh, Mike and the rest of the commissioners, the, the possibility of <clears throat> the, the company coming in, doing upgrades to the kitchen or other areas, the lodge, 
to suit the kind of events they want was an area that I have, um, I don't want to come concerns, but I just want to make sure there's an agreement for both parties on what that means. Um, so that if, you know, later on they decide that they don't want to continue at the end of the contract, you know, are they going to be looking for money? Are we going to say, okay, that's fine. We're, we're going to write these down according to a tax schedule based on what the value of the property is. And, you know, maybe there's a smaller amount to get back. I, you know, so if they're talking about doing any kind of upgrades, I think we need to make sure right up front, we, we understand what that means for the, the town and the party. Yeah. Um, to that point, Brian, I did put a note in um, to the attorney to um, somehow, well, to put wording in there that any change they may want to make has to, you know, requires the approval of the park commission and or the board of selectmen and or the park, uh, the building commissioner. So um, I'm whole, waiting for, you know, the attorney to clarify how the best way is to do that, but he knows that that's something we want in there. Well, I also think to Brian's point, though, we should uh, figure out if um, who's responsible for what, if there is improvements that need to be done. Then, yeah. you know, I mean, we're given, we're going to be giving him a three year contract. I'm sure he's not going to say, well, I'm going to put $100,000 in there. No. So um, I think we need to try to outline the framework of that so uh, we understand and he understands. And the park commission understands what may or may not be done. Yep. So, and well, I know, that's... yeah. Um, in my, you know, just my preliminary conversation with them, they, you know, they said, well, you know, we might like to add some, you know, really pretty flowers to the gazebo or things like that. And I, you know, I suggested, and actually I, you know, spoke to the, to, to Frank, to the DPW director. I said, I don't know how this is going to go over who's going to be responding to whom, but, you know, there's still a lot of unknowns here, but um, I think some of that will work itself out, even if we, you know, take a one look first and then figure out what the rest of the questions are so we can address them. But again, you know, the attorney's suggestion is just not to rush into a contract just to try to get it right. So. Yeah. It feels to me, it's a little open-ended uh, yeah. at this point. Um, yeah. Having owned a business before and um, rented like this, I know that there are generally two different um, um, classifications of improvements. One would be, say, he um, he fixed the Ansel system over the um, over the oven there. That's a built-in unit. That would be something that he chooses to do and stays with the. You know, if he leaves after three years, it stays. Um, if he brings in extra um, refrigerators or something like that, where that would be considered a, um, uh, a removable item that belongs to them. Todd, you could probably tell me better, but that in my past experience, that's been the, um, the way I've, I've done business. So. Okay. So we got that piece to try to get this yep. contract together to outline, you know, the, um, um, Yep, all the conditions. I can, all yeah, the conditions I can. Of the I can. Um, I did put in there permissions on changes and a few other things on any changes, um, but I will. I will update that and send um, the attorney a specific. You know what changes stay, what changes go, um, at the end of the contract, and he may even suggest that on his own because he does these all the time. So. Okay, before we move off of this, Rich. Um, I don't know, we're, not, we're not moving off of it yet. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, there were two other th areas um, that he um, indicated. He wants to use the um, area that um, Nelly is now in, um, using yeah. for an office for the, for the Parks Commission. He wants th to use that for his office, for his people. Um, and um, so that kind of uh, translates to getting back into our office building. And the other thing was he asked if he could use the um, storage part of the um, office, our office building for store. He's going to bring in some um, fancy wedding chairs um, and doesn't want to leave them in the lodge and was asking about storage for that. So I don't know what the answer is there. He just mentioned it to me. I thought I'd bring it up to you folks. Um, I, okay. I, I don't know. We haven't talked about it in the park department about letting them use that space or what we have planned for that space. 
But yeah. um, I, I think I addressed the office space, um, but I didn't, I will definitely add that to my list on the storage and actually probably have a comp, maybe you, me and Nate should sit down and just ask some of these questions and just figure it out. Um, trust me, he has enough to start working on right now. <laughs> I can give him these changes and he can probably plug them in. Okay. Well, that needs to happen sooner than later. Yeah. Because, yep. Okay. So the important thing right now is to look at the revenues, Mike. Yeah. And, um, you know, in looking at your budget over the last four or five years, okay, the hall rental is the hall rental, right? That goes directly to us, right? Yeah, but it's not going to, right? No, it is. It, well, the contract, the, I, we haven't, nobody's talked about this yet, yet, but the contract would be a similar situation where, okay, whatever the rental, let's say it's $4,000. I don't know what it is, but in the contract would, would need to be reviewed. It says, okay, it's $4,000 for the hall rental. It's X thousands of dollars for the catering service, but it's my understanding and, and that we're going to get a hundred percent of those hall rental fees, right? We always have. You're asking me, I don't know. I didn't, I have nothing to do with this. Um, you know, the uh, contract, he indicated to me that it was a whole package. It was hall rental, catering and bar. And we were getting a percentage of that. Um, because I was, that was my question as well, Rich. We, you know, that, so that has to be straightened out with him. I don't know. I don't know. I didn't work on the, uh, the, uh, I, I thought the percentage in, um, the, according to the RFP, I believe that the uh, percentage would be based upon the uh, catering service and the bar rental. Okay, good. I, that's my understanding. As long as he understands that before he signs the contract. Yeah. Yep. We'll make sure. We'll make sure of that. Um, is that your understanding, Leah? Yeah, I didn't think how the rental for the hall isn't a whole lot of money, though. Correct, Mike? Oh, no, I thought no, it was seven thousand dollars. It is. It's very much a lot of money. Yeah. 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 I must have been I must be thinking of something else then. Yeah. The hall rental is many times it's the most that we get out of something, especially in a especially on a something like a um a uh, like um ocean spray comes for the day. Yeah. Um there's not a big catering and bar thing for that. It's mostly uh it's mostly uh the um fee for the, you know, using the thing. Or uh, one of these bike races or something like that. Those, that's where we make the money on those. So if I look back at like FY19, there was 130, call it 132,000 in total revenues. But of that, 87 came from the hall rentals themselves. Yep. So the bar and the food were much less. Yep. But the, uh, help me out, Mike, I, I believe, and Todd's there too, that we got 100% of the uh, hall rentals. That is correct. Okay. And I would, I would assume that would be the same. No? Yes? That, that is what I was operating under, so we'll want to make sure all parties agree. Right. Okay, I just want to make sure that clarification was we're trying to put the revenue projections here together overall, you know, high-level revenue projections. I mean, I'm looking at a contract here, and it says to rent um, the diamond room for five hours – on a weekend is nine hundred and fifty dollars. Is that us or that uh, or the new contract? This is this is an existing contract that we have. The yeah. Cassidy the Cassidy room for five hours for a weekend rate is four hundred dollars, and the gazebo for the wedding is a hundred. So technically, if you want a gazebo wedding, it would be the 400 plus the 100 or the 950. That's why I don't know where 4,000 is, is coming from. Unless I'm missing 4, another 000. charge somewhere. But those were always, um, Mike, those were always separate contracts. You know that the Park Commission signed that contract. That came to the town. And then the uh, pre previous vendor was the bar service. Okay, mm -hmm. that was their piece. Yeah. And then the caterers was another piece. So I mean, there were three different pieces, but I think putting all this together, I don't, I mean, I hope not, that they're going to be getting all the rental fees for the building. 
I don't think that's the case. But In the RFP itself, I'll read, was proposals from qualified proposers to enter into contract with the town for event management services, comma, food service and bartending service, comma, for events to be held at the town-owned building known as Loon Pond Lodge. Okay, that's the answer. Okay, okay. That's, a, that's good. That'll, that means we'll actually make a lot more money because we're not paying any management fees. So if you if you look at that piece, and let, let's say we, you know, it's been pretty consistent, except for last year, you know, that it's been in the 80s. So if we take that number, I know you're projecting 80 here, but um, so, I mean, if it's between 80, 85, whatever it is, so that's $85,000 that would come to the, from the revenue from the park, the, the uh, Loom Pond Lodge. Um, so then if you look at the uh, bar service, and you can see the bar service was kind of all over the place, you know, 26,018, 16,019, 14,020, and 21, we, we're not even going to consider. But I don't know, I guess we had this discussion before, why there's such a difference between 18 and 20 and 21. So let's pretend, if you want, we, we, I'm almost positive it's going to be higher than that. But, you know, if we take and say, okay, it's going to be $20,000. I'm just throwing that out, okay, as a bar service. And then you got the, um, the food service, which outside of 2021, um, it's been consistent too. It's in the twenties and I see a budget of $25,000. Okay. So if you look at those numbers, Mike, and you say, okay, Lumpon Lodge is uh 10, 11, dollars And actually we've been averaging more than that. It's been averaging about 145 or somewhere in that area. So now you don't have to pay for the event management fees. So you're actually way ahead. Yeah, uh, let me point one thing out though. Uh, those numbers on the um, the caterers and the uh, liquor was based on a twenty percent, or we could argue eighteen, twenty percent, whatever. Uh, and now it's going to be twelve percent. Right. But if you look at the volume, at least in the first year, anyways, the volume of transactions, you know, is going to be much higher. I believe it's going to be much higher based upon what he's trying to do. And uh, if you even take the, the 15, 16% in the second and third year, and then you take out the uh, event management services, you know, we're still far ahead. We're still ahead, you know, overall. I agree. I agree, especially if you're not paying anything. I mean, we're getting the full 100% of the hall rental fee. Um, okay. Again, I, I, I just want to emphasize, I think we need to, you need to, uh, verify that because I don't believe that's what he thinks is happening. Okay. Well, we'll have to verify that for sure. I'll work. Yeah. I'll take care of it tomorrow. Okay. The, um, so if we, we're just trying to talk, we don't know, you know, the, the projections at this point, we've got to do the best we think we can and we'll reevaluate it during the year or whatever. And hopefully it all comes out, you know, in the end, but, I, I mean, I think using a similar number of, you know, 130 altogether, including the rentals, to $145,000 is probably a conservative number. Todd, do you feel that way? You do? Nodding. Okay. He's muted. All right. And then we take out the, um, the event management fee. Uh, which was budgeted at uh, 35000 I think. Uh, whatever. Yeah, I think it was thirty five. Thirty five. Yeah. Okay. So we take that out. So the other question, Mike, is having to do with, uh, if you're looking at the expense items, what is the $7,500 for the cleaning service? Is that, I know that we had to hire a cleaning service. Yeah. Know? So there's a cleaning service that comes in after every um, event. Um, Todd, you could probably help us out with this. Um, there was an accounting 
question that uh, I don't I don't know that much about. Uh, Scott knows about it more than I do, but that cleaning service is what we pay. We charge, however, more than that for each event. So say we charge, um, say that's based on, uh, we pay $160 for the whole building to be clean. We charge 200, okay? But I don't know how the accounting got worked yeah, out. I don't it's, either. The, but the, the revenue, I believe, and Todd could help us with this, I believe the revenue shows up in the um, um, actual um, rental of the um, facility. Okay. I, I believe uh, you're right, Mike. Yeah. Yep. Okay. That's so, my understanding too. So, Leah, one of the things that I thought was going to happen was that Boston Tavern would charge that fee, Okay whatever that fee is, $200, whatever they want to charge. They would then be responsible to do the cleaning service. I think that's the way the RFP is um, written that it says, hold on. It says uh, under the scope, it says coordinate, manage, supervise, and oversee all aspects of the event held at the facility including without limitation staff, public safety, setup, breakdown, cleaning, and custodial services and trash removal. Okay. So that's in the scope. So then, Mike, the $7,500 that's in the expense item for that can be eliminated. Oh, yep. Okay. Yep. And uh, just uh, Nelly just texted me to say that um, to confirm that what we just said about that, that, um, $7,500 is offset in the uh, hall rental. Okay. So that's great. That's fantastic. So, go ahead. They're going to still charge a cleaning fee? I. That's up to them. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I See, I, I have to check with Tim now. I, I assumed what was going to happen. It was that so they were going to charge a nominal fee for the room. And then they would just charge like whatever it was, like you would do any function, uh, $45 a person for whatever dinner. And then the bar would be in addition to that. And that's what we were gonna get the um, percentage on. So um, I have to go back and reread the proposal that part where Brian read and just have, try to digest that again. So just to verify, and it's, <laughs> The the whole um, the, the whole structure of the um, uh, billing and everything is going to be changed. Um, right. So right. so it's it, it's very different. This is a stab in the dark, right? Um, as far as what the revenue is going to be. Okay. Well, does everybody, including Todd, you know, feel comfortable with the numbers that we just talked about that we can use as the revenue projections and then reduce those two expense numbers? The thirty-five thousand and the seventy-five thousand, seventy-five hundred, uh, from from a budgeting standpoint. I mean, that's the best guess we got right now. Yep, Todd, do you agree? I mean, I I think that's that's a good place to be. Yeah, I'm fine with that. I would just say that we need to collectively revisit it in the fall to see how things are going, and in the event we need to make a modification. We'd want to try to address that at the fall town meeting because, believe it or not, this estimated revenue, if, if it turns out to not be, if it turns out to be too aggressive, we may have tr trouble or a holdup in getting our, our town tax rate approved because they also look at these revenues as part of the rate setting, uh, rate approval process. So um, otherwise, I, I'm, I'm on board. Yeah. Um, well, I... So the new budget starts July 1st, correct? So that still gives us a couple of months to get things more and more reopened. Right. Well, I think, I think though, Leah, that um, once Boston Tavern takes over, I think they're going to get a feel for, you know, the marketing and the bookings yep. and stuff like that pretty quickly. Because yep. I think we know now that the COVID-19 restrictions will be lifted that I think there's going to be a lot of activity. 
Yeah. Well, what I'm saying, though, is it doesn't start May 1st. It technically starts July 1st. So that gives us a couple more months for things to open up a little more um, to, to get to that more participation, more people in attendance goals. So I think once that happens, I don't think they're going to have a problem at all selling the place out. <laughs> well, well, to look at, so their, their revenue projections, right? So the year one, which I think we all agree to probably be a little weird um, and while things are opening up, I mean, their projection was $300,000 percent of town in year one is 12%. So it's $36,000 of revenue share. If we look back historically, um, FY20 appears to be the closest. Now, given that probably the tail end of that was when COVID started coming in, but minus the hall rentals, we made 35,000 that year based on that 18, 20% number, whatever it was in the end. So, um, you know, they would have to be hitting their revenue projection that they gave us or better to, to be in that ballpark, I think, just kind of looking at it quickly um, based on the differences there. But yes, then once we start pulling out that 7,500 in the management fee, we might be better off even still. Yeah, yeah correct. Okay. You know, I, would, uh, I would say that uh, also that uh, I, I, he mentioned that their, their prices would probably be higher than what we're charging now. Um, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Um, to address what you had said earlier, Leah, um, this is their business as well. So they, they do exactly the same as what the management company we had before. Yeah. They have people that uh, act as wedding uh, event planners, right? And and initially, to go through all the emails and all the you know he's def he said he's definitely going to have someone on full time, you know, forty hours a week at least for the foreseeable future until they weed through every single lead and make sure that they you know get everything booked and respond to everybody whether that means telling them there is no space available so the you know the person can go on to the next venue um yeah okay so high I level one, I just, excuse me Rich, i just got one sure. question just a clarification if, if i heard it right i know mike you said that you didn't know for sure if the guy the gentleman from boston tavern was aware that we get 100 percent of the hall rental I don't know anymore. I mean, we didn't have anything to do with it. I, I think, I, I, you know, um, I have to go over what Brian read again, but I, I think it's a, we're thinking about everything in a different way. So the reason that was done that way was because that was basically where the town was making most of its money was the hall rental. And the caterers would come in separately and the bar would come in separately. But now... I think it's more like a per person type of charge. So they're going to be charging per person for appetizers per person for, you know, so that was my, that's the way I just assumed it was going to work. So, um, but not I, as far as the hard went on those concerns. Well, hmm. I thought they were going to be working in part of the hall rental. So we need to definitely look at that tomorrow. The reason I ask is, you know, that's about eighty thousand dollars. We said ballpark. You'd have somebody dedicated forty hours. Is he counting on that for that person, and not realizing it doesn't go to him? That's all. Um, we're gonna. I am gonna clarify that. Hopefully tomorrow. All right. Yeah. That's not the way the RFP is uh, stated, Joe. Just as uh, Brian yep. had said. So. Yeah. Yeah, but just, I'll yeah, definitely. But it's it's got to be clarified. You're absolutely yeah. right. That could, that could be a showstopper. Oh, time. absolutely. That's what would be a showstopper. Yep. Yep. <laughs> okay. So let's go under the assumption of those numbers projections. Um, and looking at the, um, the other revenue numbers, Mike, you know, um, I, uh, I guess other field rentals, the 33,000, is that primarily the league's? Sorry, I was on mute. Um, yes, it is, um, but it doesn't. What what was it last year? I, I'm not seeing it here. Uh, thirty four. Last year was thirty four, and we're projecting thirty three for this year. Right. Okay, so we have just raised all the fees. Last year we raised them thirty percent, um, and this year we have voted on to um, any of the groups that are 
there for a longer period of time, uh, such as um, pickleball, rather than charging uh, them one twenty dollar per head fee for March, April, all the way through November, um, we voted to break that up into two separate seasons. Two sixteen was it, Joe? Was it sixteen week seasons? Yeah, yeah, four month seasons. So those uh, those revenues should double. Uh, that and um, volleyball. I'm trying to think of what else. Blooper ball. Blooper ball. Um, so we, that number should be higher. Uh, if, we, if we put it lower than last year, that's incorrect. It should go slightly higher. They, okay, so you're saying the 33000 should be higher? Yes. Okay. Do you want to? Uh, can I just mention the thirty four was a budget estimate, not actual revenue? Right. That's the true. last full year was FY19 at 28,000. So that may be a better base year to add the 30% to. Well, that was the year that we added the 30%. Okay. So great. Thank you. So 20, 20 should re, uh, re, um, reflect that 30% increase. Yes. Okay. And then okay. from from there, we added probably it's not going to be as much, but maybe another two, two or three thousand dollars. Okay, so you feel good about the 33? Uh, at least. At least the 33, okay. Um, I guess the group outings, I don't know what that is, but whatever. I mean, that's a reasonable number, it looks like, right? Where are we at? We at the top here? Yeah, it's uh, group outing fees. No, you got $5,000. I believe stuff. that that was from Clear Pond. Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse yeah. me. All right. There's, no, it says TWC at the end. I thought it was. I, yeah, I thought it was Ted Williams too. Yeah, I knew the group outing <laughs> fees from Ted Williams went to into the um, the hall rental fees. Okay, so this group outing is Clear Pond. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly what you're looking at, so. There are two group are outing the lines. There's two. There are two. Clear Pond and Ted Williams. Yeah. Clear Pond's two hundred and fifty dollars from twenty one. Sorry, but it stands out easy. Okay, so the group outing fees for Ted Williams is okay. How much was it? Five grand. I don't, I don't, I don't see it. I'm, not, I'm sorry. I'm just not seeing it here. Mm. Go to the old one. All right. Uh, group out. Oh, here it goes. Group outing fees. TWC. Uh, yeah, we. I, I have here. Um, yeah, five thousand. We, we, we had a budget of four thousand last year. Actual for for twenty twenty was fifty seven twenty. Um, honestly, I we could probably ask some help for the rest of the, the commission here. I'm, I'm trying to think of what uh, the group outing fees were at uh, Ted Williams camp, other than perhaps we had some uh, company parties that were done outside. Anybody? Yeah, I don't. I don't know what went into that one, Mike. I, I can't remember that one. Are, are those events we would expect the new vendor to take over or are those kind of separate in what they are? You know, I, I, I have to look at the detail and I don't know really what they are specifically. I'm going to, Brian, mm -hmm. I, I believe that it's in addition to what we were collecting through Southeast management. Okay. But, um, so at the, the actual um, breakdown, I can't tell you exactly what that 5,700 is. Well, I got a I, oh, excuse me. Go ahead, Brian. I was just kind of asking for educational purposes. Like, a, or is that more of like a, you know, a company does a small morale event and wants to use a baseball field for the day or something? Or? Yeah, they do that a lot. Okay. We have a lot of that. Um, I'm just trying to think. It just seems in my, uh, my mind here, it seems like a me, lot. Mike, would that be the tri test? That was going to be my question, Paula. Go ahead. Uh, he, it may, it may be, it, it's an outing, and uh, it's separate from all our other scheduled 
events. So I'm wondering if something like TriFest would be part of that because it's a high number. I was going to. I was going to ask the question: Where is TriFest in the revenue numbers? <laughs> it's probably under the group outings. <laughs> but didn't you? I, I, I thought I heard some numbers recently that it was going to. I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but I thought it was up to ten thousand dollars somewhere in that area. Now, did I miss that? It is. Uh, they talked about that, so uh, maybe that's not part of the group outing. <laughs> so where is? Where do you think the uh, the ten thousand dollars? should be, or, or maybe, is it in hall rental? I don't know. Well, it was 8000 the last time for TriFest, and we're anticipating, uh, because we increased their fees, right, Mike, to uh, a couple dollars, if I'm correct, uh, up to well, $7. So that's projected to be over $10,000 from TriFest in 2021. Yes. Yeah, even under know. other field rentals? Where is that? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm looking to try to find the detail on this report so that I can give you a better answer. Um, no, which, would, which would bring up my point and Joe's point that that does, money doesn't belong to Boston Tavern. No, 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 you know not I mean? at all. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. If that's uh, the only question, then no, it wouldn't. It's, it's in addition to. But if it was eight thousand dollars in FY twenty, there's only a handful of accounts here that that could have fallen under. Gate fees, other field rentals. I didn't think oh, it was really you... five thousand. I didn't. I think it was eight thousand, Paul. When did you get eight thousand? Nelly has. Joined. It was. It was eight thousand the last time from the dry fest. That's what Mike had come up Nelly, with. Hey, Nelly is just. Well, okay, okay. Nelly, Nelly has our answer, Joe. <laughs> I just allowed her to come in. Thank you. Uh oh. Uh oh. Unmute. How good are you at miming? <laughs> She's still not there. <laughs> yeah. We can get um, her dial in if she needs the dial in. Did that work? Take you go. Yay. Hey, hey, hi, oh, hi, hi. <laughs> Sorry, it was a quick login, so technical diff difficulties. I can help with this answer. So uh, the other field rental, not the other field rentals, the um, the one you're speaking about, the 5,000. Group outings. Group outings, fees. Group outings, thank you. Yes. That is the per participant fee from TriFest. So that's separate from their lodge rental and the catering we get and bartending for the weekend. Okay. So together, uh, the hall rental for the weekend plus that par per participant fee would make up that we get around the ten thousand dollars from them. Okay, so is that five thousand dollar number right, or does it need to be upped? Uh, it, it's probably correct for TriFest uh, for this year. He did think that there would may be less participation depending on what the regulations are at that time. So then we definitely shouldn't increase it. Right. Okay. I'm just curious to where it was. That's all. The per participant, uh, per participant fee is going to be higher this year, but there he's projecting that there's going to be less folks doing it because of the COVID and whatnot. I bet you that's going to change. But well, anyways, we won't worry about that now. Did they use the hall just as the like an empty room, or do they also do food and beverage for that event? Or? They do food and beverage um, uh, two days, one day, one day, um, where they sort of have like a lunch or something, and it was Ricardi's, if I remember correctly, and they always just do pizza and bartending to kind of celebrate the end on the Sunday. So okay, we'll I'll figure how me. that works then going forward. Well, if, if they use inside the lodge, does that now belong to the management company? To, uh, do we go through them? Right. Not the, right. not the rent out of the building. Yeah. All goes to us. I'm, right. But do we have to go through Boston Tavern for them to get into the building and to use the facility? Yeah. That's my question. Um, well, I did put in the contract that... Uh, the park commission and or the town needs 24 seven hour access to the building. 
So it's not like they cannot let us in there, but um, I put in a couple of things about that, but I have four questions tonight that I need to get answered so we can get them in the contract properly. Can they use a different Here's another one? Here's Please. another one for you. Who is going to be collecting the fees for, in the past, Southeast Management collected the um, hall rental fees? Yeah, I believe it's in there that they're going to collect the fees. And Darren, to your, to your question, um, they had to, as part of the uh, proposal, they had to agree to honor any already existing contracts um, with caterers. But going forward, they are going to do the food predominantly unless someone, um, and, and they even said this, they're professionals. They said, if someone comes to us and says, we want to do a pig roast or have a food truck, that's something we can't do. We would definitely like contract that out. So they'd be responsible for getting all these save, serve, save and safe and um, all the licensing. And, you know, so like I said, this, this contract's like 21, 25 pages long. So um, there's a lot going on here. But I, I would say, and I, Todd, speak up, please, that um, event management, the uh, SEM, um, kept the deposits. And going forward, uh, we want the uh, contracts and the deposits to go to the uh, accounting office so they can keep track of it and monitor it and, and so forth. So I think that would be a change. Um, that needs yeah. to be. I mean, that, that would definitely be a change and they can't completely give up control of the contract because they have to, you know, that's where they write the people, the food, the this, the that. So yes, they would probably have to send us a copy of the contract, but they need to keep the original so that they can work off of. Oh no, I expected that. But what I'm saying is that they sign a contract, they get a thousand dollar deposit. That contract with that check needs to go to the accounting office and they record it and they keep track of it and say, okay, this has been rented on this, this thing and so forth. And as the event, whatever happens, either the final payment or additional payments or whatever, then that would come into the town as well. But before SEM kept all of those deposits, and as you know, that was an issue because of an accounting. And so we want to just want to make sure that they know that we want to make sure we know what we're entitled to as well. Yeah. I just, um, they got to manage it, the contract. Yeah. It's, it's a little complicated because then we have to make sure that each person gets credit for what they've given us versus what they've given. I mean, I, I still think it should go through one source and either, they give us the percentage or we give them the difference of the percentage. So I, I just don't know how we. Well, we're not going to get a percentage up front. We're not going to get a percentage until the event happens. Right. Right. So right. all I'm saying is from a depositing standpoint, whatever our policy is that we got a contract and you're going to get $500 deposit, you know, for the hall rental, then we should have files and keep track of that, you know, in the accounting office. Right, Todd? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I know. It's just, um, I, I just see a lot more bookkeeping to do it that way than, um, than just requiring, which I put in the contract requiring, um, you know, within 30 days, a, a monthly bookkeeping. Um, but you know what, Todd, if you have any suggestions on how um, you want to see it done, I'm just afraid that, so, so let's say a, a function costs $10,000 in total and they put down $1,000. So we have the check for $1,000. Well, then it's up to them to collect the final check so that they can get paid and then they have to figure out the difference minus what they've already given us. Whereas if they just collect everything, they figure out the percentage and they cut us one check. Does that make sense to anyone but me? 
Yeah, uh, okay. it was done before. <laughs> Go ahead. That is the way it was done before. <laughs> but the problem was that we had no control over those amounts. We didn't even know what those amounts were. You right. Know. Well, they, they, but, they, I put in there in two different places the reporting that they have to give us, you know, monthly reports of everything. You know, what they're taking in and what it's, you know, what each person is. And actually, SEM did have a lot of that in the in the contracts. When I was going through the contracts, they had copies of everybody's deposit slips. They had copies of credit card transactions, copies of checks. So... Um, and, and would it make things more difficult or would it make things easier if, you know, the process was, okay, you've got an event that costs $10,000, uh, you know, make a check out for 500 to the town of Lakeville for the hall deposit and 500 to the event management for the food and beverage deposit. I think. Or use viewpoint. I think, I think it needs to be decided. That's what I think. And I don't think, I think we owe them the courtesy of helping us make the decision. That's what I think. I think whatever we decide, we need to live with, but I do think that they should have some, you know, some say in how they want to do their bookkeeping too. And Nelly has a question. <laughs> uh, more of just a comment. I just wanted to mention how um, I believe it was much easier for our clients to make a larger deposit such as $500 because SEM could accept credit card transactions. Uh, versus our old process, which was checks only. Yeah. Um, I also think too, going through the files, we definitely have people who have made regular payments over the course of the 18 months where they planned their function. So they were making, you know, small payments as opposed to uh, just cutting a huge check for $10,000, the balance that was due 10, 10 days before the event. I think that's the part I know that everyone else doesn't, and Nellie knows that. Um, so now every time a person makes a $250 payment every two weeks towards their, you know, and that's that's financial planning. That's some of the way people, you know, they, they pay for their, their event. Mm -hmm. um, then we're constantly, okay, at some point, our end is going to be paid, and then we have to get the rest of the money back to Boston Tavern. So, I, I, I would think... make a suggestion, if I may, that we don't do that, and we do what I think is more typical, which is you got a deposit, you've got like a half of it due a month out, and then the remainder due a week out, or whatever it is. I mean, anybody tracking fifty dollars here or sixty-five dollars there, that's going to drive everybody nuts. Well, not if Boston Taverns telling us that the event's 10 grand and this is the money we've collected so far in a report. Uh, we have no, I mean, we, we have no reason, we have no reason to believe that, that, um, that they can't manage the deposits. So um, I'd like to make their job easier too, and and our own accounting department. We don't have one dedicated person, you know, to do all this accounting. But again, this is something that needs to be decided. And the reason I'm trying not to speed through the contract, even though we want it done yesterday. Can I just ask the accountant what is, what his opinion is? Mr. Uh, well, uh, my general answer to your question, ma'am, is that I would think the town would want custody of the funds and not to leave it in a third party's hands. And I think that was the point Chairman LaCamera was trying to make. Um, you know, in, in other park uh, programs similar to this, to Brian's point, you know, the, the people doing the rental might write two checks rather than one. And maybe one goes to Boston Tavern and one goes to the town of Lakeville. Um, but I guess, you know, it's a lot of money. I, there aren't that many events. It, it's not an overwhelming task we're talking about. Um, Is it, a I, it, it would seem that the town would want custody or some sort of bond or assurance uh, that the town would recover these funds if they're not in the town's custody. And I agree with him. I think that he makes, 
I think that makes perfect sense to me that any money that is deposited or given to Boston Tavern should go to the accountant. Well, there, there's a thought. I mean, do we want to do a bond that, you know, should they up and disappear? We've got some recourse. Well, if, if they are giving money to the accountant, then they're not going to get it back, right, if they get up and disappear. Question. You know what? I'm, I'm open to doing... I just need to know what the, what the majority wants. As a business person, I see it maybe differently than Todd does. I absolutely respect Todd's opinion. I do. Um, and you know what? It really doesn't matter what I want. I think it matters here more what Todd, who's our accountant, wants. And maybe we leave it up to Todd to work it out with Boston Tavern on the accounting end of it. And just tell me how to write it up in the contract. I can also ask uh, Mike, he was a businessman. Uh, do you have any thoughts? Uh, My thoughts uh, would be that the company would expect to be bonded. Um, and they do this. Um, they are better at this than we have ever been. This is their business. So I think we should uh, negotiate, Leah, with them. Um, and they can tell us the best way. As long as we tell them that the town wants the deposit i'm sure they can work it out they can um they have they have money they they can uh keep it in a escrow type account or something um and and send it to us i'm not i don't, I don't see that as a sticking problem with with the new vendor i really don't i think they, no, I, I they don't, know what to do with this i don't see it as a sticking problem i just see say i just know that we did it one way before when the contract ended, we recruit, we got all the monies that were owed to us verified through the, I'm pretty sure I, you know, reconciled most of it. Um, I may, I don't know if Todd reconciled it and I missed something, but um, so I just need to know how we need to write it up in the contract. So someone other than me, because I'm not doing the bookkeeping on a daily basis here needs to figure it out. Can I ask a question, please? Yes. Who if who keeps the deposit if the if they back out? Well, there is a clause that says if they back out within sixty days, they get their money back. Okay, let's say they do it within thirty days. Who gets to keep the money? I haven't experienced that, so I can't answer that. Maybe the we park commission. The can. I can't answer that. The previous we company, the, money, the right? previous company returned it to us. Right. So, so I think that's your answer, right? So the money belongs to the deposit belongs to us. Yes. Yes. So like, we should, we should get that money because if they do back out in 30 days, we have the money. If not, we're relying on the vendor to, to send us money that belongs to us. Yeah. Just for your information, not that it applies to this contract, but Darren, um, we didn't, we didn't have anyone canceling super late anyways for COVID, but we, 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 anyone that was citing COVID was, you know, so in case shows up somewhere, just so you but know. I understand. I'm just saying from a business perspective, Yep. the money belongs to Lakeville. So we should, we should hold on to the money. Okay, okay, so we'll, so we'll get off on this subject, and then it's obvious that something has to be discussed about. Well, that. you know what? I mean, it sounds it sounds to me like you know Todd. Um, uh, more people agree with the way Todd wants to see it done. So maybe Todd, you can put together some kind of language for me that I can approach them with, and maybe we can work on that together. And just one more thing, on top of this, it's cash basis, right, Todd? Like we, we work, we book things on a cash basis. Um, not sure the nature well, so of it. If we know, if we know we're going to get 20,000, I'm throwing out a number. If we know we're going to get $10,000 from an event, but we're getting 500 deposit, once that 500 deposit's paid, that's guaranteed. Yeah. That additional 9,500 may or may not hit the books. You don't book that 9,500 until you get the cash is received. Right, right. Right, right. So my point is once you receive the cash, you should book. It. Yeah, and, and all I was gonna add to that, Darren, is if the event, the deposit was for an event in a subsequent fiscal year, we would escrow the funds and not recognize the revenue. 
because the you know there was still the potential that that deposit may be refunded. Uh, it would right. the revenue would be recognized at the time the event occurred. Right. Yeah, and that's that's going to be a common occurrence if you. I mean, in, in, in my opinion, I think they're going to have the 2021 and the 2022 calendar filled within 30 days of taking over. So that's going to be a constant part of the bookkeeping. So almost every deposit we get, we then have to not only mark when we received it, the date of the event and the day of which they can no longer get what's their final cancellation date. Right. So that if you are crossing that fiscal boundary, but they can't, the final, you know, cancellation date is June 18th. Well, that's right. and, ours and, now. And, we're, we're talking you know, a minimum of 52 events, right? And that's, that's maximum every weekend for the entire year. Well, then you, you have Saturday, you have, sa you have right. Saturday and Sunday, you have weekdays sometimes. So, I mean, there, but there could potentially be a lot of dates and, you know, the only other problem I see is like I said, if someone says, geez, I want to pay for my wedding slowly, are we going to say, no, you can't do that. So, um, I can pay and then, the, and then the, the, yeah, the, the, Boston Tavern. Tavern takes that. Yeah. Is that up to Boston Tavern to decide that? Yeah. I would think. We're only concerned about the deposit. If they want to give Boston Tavern a thousand dollars a month until the wedding shows, Hey, right. that's fine. Okay. Right? Uh, okay, I, I will just do what the group wants. <laughs> okay, um, let's. Uh, okay, so we kind of talked about some of the revenues. One of the, one of the ones that we still need to talk about, and um, you know, your budget overall from an expense standpoint and from a revenue standpoint, it was is out of balance by fifty seven thousand dollars. Okay, and one of the reasons for that is that there's, um, we do have, you do have some retained earnings, about 61,000, if I remember the number correctly, Todd. That certainly can be used, but we're trying to protect that right now because we don't know what's going to happen with the balance of um, fiscal 21. I mean, you know, you can't continue to go into a deficit spending and um, we, we're not sure that's going to happen but I, and I don't know if you looked at it through um, through February yet, um, Todd. But, but anyways, so not using any retained earnings to balance your budget at this point, which you've always done in the past, as you know, um, that what I see right now is that $57,000 uh, is short. And I see that um, we've agreed that we're going to be able to reduce that by $42,000 because of the uh, event management and because of the uh, cleaning service, okay? So that gets us down to roughly $15,000, assuming, like Joe says, that we're going to get the rental fees. I mean, that's a big if. We're going to have a big problem if we don't get those rental fees, okay? So uh, if that's okay. So now we need to talk about, you know, the hi, Scott. Now we need to talk about the um, the uh, Claire Pawn, you know, situation. Um, there may have been a little misunderstanding that I don't think we ever said that the town was going to pick up 100% of the cost, you know, of Claire Pawn. So what needs to be talked about as far as the Claire Pawn is concerned is the um, season pass revenue and... Um, I guess what you guys call gate fees. Um, and you are projecting in there $2,500. Um, how did you come up with the $2,500? Can I, can I jump in, please? Um, now that we're done with Loon Pond Lodge, I apologize, but I really do have to cut out my apologies. I am not having a very good week here. Okay. All right. Earlier. Thank you. All right. Good night. Good night. Thank you. So how, how did we come up with that $25, $25 for season passes? Um, I believe that was reduced by considering that it was going to be um, townspeople only. Um, okay. You know, Scott's here now, so he has a better handle on all of this than I do. So how much was that for a pass? Uh, I believe it was $80 last year. 
So it's eighty dollars. Is that how you calculated it? No, we, we didn't calculate it that way because we were under the assumption that possibly the town was going to fund it, so that we could not have any out of town people there. Well, we're definitely not going to be able to fund it. So, I mean, you got to charge people that are using it, town residents, you know, a fee. It's no different than them playing little league or softball or whatever it happens to be or going to the transfer station. We never said that we would fund at 100%, Scott. Okay, the, the, the $45,000 doesn't cover 100%, but that, that's okay, whatever. I mean. <laughs> so why, why did, how did you come up with the $2,500 season passes then? It was an estimate. It wasn't okay. an estimate based. It wasn't on meant to replace seasons passes. It was. It was more in the way of, of gate fees um, for guests. The, the 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 numbers we came up with were they're, they're, they mean nothing if 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 the town's not gonna gonna do that. So I mean, we'd have to reevaluate those numbers. So if I remember correctly, the number that was floated out there, uh, Rich, was $25,000. Is that correct? Uh, yes, yes and no. Okay. But the first thing is to determine, you know, how many season passes. I mean, if it's $80 a piece, let's say, okay, does that mean it's 300 passes? Does that mean it's 400 passes? I don't believe it's ever been that many. Do we know how many people used the park last year at eighty dollars a pass? I wasn't here, so I'm. Does I don't know. Have to, I have to ask them. I have no idea. Nelly's got the information. Oh, on oh okay, Nelly. <laughs> uh, while we're trying to figure out, can I ask what field electric is on revenues? It's the charge That's that we. Uh, the extra charge that we send to all of the different uh, uh, groups that use lights or electricity, oh, okay. such as um, volleyball or blooper ball, they have lights. Um, Nelly does a great job of um, calculating what we pay to um, uh, uh, MGE, and we pass that on to the. It's on. It's understood by all the users. All right. Perfect. So if someone wants to have a night volleyball game or whatever, they're, they're paying for that, that electricity. That makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. I don't know if I could just make a general ask. Um, you folks are much more aware of these line items than someone like myself. It'd be great if the descriptions, you know, kind of had, whether it's CLR pond or CP or TWC, like in the same place in each line, just so we can more quickly identify what they are. Brian? Yes. We, we've tried to change the chart of, chart of accounts for multiple years. <laughs> okay. One of those, it's harder than it looks things. These chart of accounts go back years. So did Nelly come up with any numbers for... Oh. 2019. I can't hear you. Breaking up, Nelly. That any better? A little bit. I'll get some things. All right. Uh, 2019, we had 97 resident passes. And how many out of town passes? Uh, it was 42, I think. 97 in town, and how many out of town? Like 42. What are how they much? Cost each? And how much did you charge for out of town people? My, um, $130. Thank you. And what's a resident pass? $80. Thank you, Nelly. Sure. So if we had 100 passes right now, okay, then at $80, it would be $8,000. Mm -hmm. All right. Fair number? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So we would assume, I would assume, my opinion, that that number of 100 passes would probably increase. Mm. By what? We have no idea. I would disagree, Rich, because there still is a, 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 a certain amount of COVID fear out there. Okay, well, that's a different issue, right? 
Okay. Well, if we're talking about uh, expected revenues, um, well, we're trying to put a program. I would use 100, and I wouldn't go over 100 myself, but. So, to, so to, if you needed, if you were trying to match, say, FY19's values there, if you if you say, no, we're not doing any out of towners this year, you'd have to bump up residents by 68 passes. So you'd need to be at 160, call it 165 or so passes to make those numbers again. Okay, so um, the quote unquote guest passes, okay, the way I think it should work, and this is just me, my opinion, because I've seen it in other towns, is that the, the household, you issue the season pass to that household, and then that household buys a um, guest pass whatever that number is, okay? And that house pass is assigned to that particular residence that can be given to somebody else to use. That's my opinion. So you, sh you, sh you show up and uh, show your, your resident pass and then hand over a, a guest pass if you got somebody with you. Correct. How would we track who is a guest and who isn't? So they have to, when they sign up for a resident pass, do they have to say like, here are the members of my family or anything? Got it. Town people in the past were not necessarily guests of someone. They were just out of town people. They weren't, most of them were not guests of anyone. So if you don't do that approach, Scott, how do you control the guest passes? Uh, you know, we're looking for ideas, Rich. Uh, my, my, I just threw out my idea. But I, just... I understand that. I said I was trying to say that in, in the past, I mean, when we were younger, you had to come in with a resident and then they would pay at the gate. The guest they have to come in as a guest of a resident. Does so the I'm... guest pay too? You know, Rich. I, I would uh, charge the guest. I'm sorry, Mike. Um... I was just going to add. Um... I had, I used to have a um, house in New Hampshire. It was part of an association and that um, model that you just said, Rich, was exactly how they did it. You paid a certain amount uh, for your family, um, for your family pass for the year, and you could buy up to a certain amount of guest passes. Um, I believe in that, in that place, it was $25 per guest pass and you could give those to whoever you wanted, you know, somebody was renting your house, you could give it to them. I guess my question is, and I'm on board with that kind of idea. I mean, it's similar to buying, uh, you know, some towns do the, the dump stickers for the bags that you put around the top of the bag. I mean, I guess my thought is like, how do you know someone shows up with a resident pass, but they loaded the car full of their kids and all their kids' friends from other towns? Like, how do you, how do you control that? How do you know who's a resident, who's not? Are you just going by the adult? I don't when think you, you buy can. a family pass. It says on it how many how many children are in the family, what okay. the family size is. Okay. So you can't just come in with a family pass and it's carte blanche and you can bring in 20 people. The family pass says six. It says two adults and four children. That's that's the max you can bring in on a on a family pass. So then at that point, you, it it almost really doesn't matter if they show up and you know they bring. You know, they got, say they got three kids and one day they show up with all three of their kids. The next day they show up with one of their kids and two of their kids' friends from out of town. I mean, it's still the same number of people they've paid for. Right. That's going to be tough to track. Yeah. Um, you know, un un unless you know the families. Right. But it would still it prevents some abuse, at least. Yeah, Scott, that, I was going to add that um, after the first week or so, the staff knows the families. <laughs> right, Nellie? No, I'm not. I'm being serious. They know the families who, you know, and, um, it's a it's a small town. Yeah, but these, uh, I guess two, I get two questions. I mean, are we, are we saying it's already a foregone conclusion that we're going to make it Lakeville only? Um, I, I don't think we've voted on that and proved that yet. Um, I, for one, not not in favor of that. So um, for what it's worth. So I don't know if we're just talking hypotheticals or if we actually have a plan that I don't know about yet to have it Lakeville only. 
think it's hypothetical, Joe, because we don't have money for Clear Pond. And unless we have the money, we can't make a, any particular guideline as to resident, non-resident. That's my understanding. What costs would you say at Clear Pond remain the same regardless of if it's, you know, you let one person in for the day or a hundred people in for the day. I mean, there must be things that you just, you have no control over. You have to have, is it number of lifeguards or parking attendants or how does that work? Correct. I mean, they're scheduled to come in, you know, and unless it rains and they close the park, um, the, the cost is what the cost is for the day, regardless if there's 10 people there or, or 150. Some values. You know, they, they will make that determination. If the, if the weather's lousy, they will close the park and send everybody home and there'd be no cost. Do the employees get paid for no. rain days? No. No. Who makes the call? Not the, the employee. Director. Okay. <laughs> I have uh, I've said many times that uh, you know I uh, I'm in support of residents only because uh, I uh, I feel that way and I there's all kinds of problems associated with out of town residents including parking and overcrowding and all kinds of issues you know having to do with that and that's how I feel so that's my opinion so I think you you decide first before you know, um, what you want. Do you want residents or you, you, uh, residents only or whatever? I mean, that's my opinion. But Has the town to ever been surveyed or uh, questioned on this issue uh, in the past? I have no idea. Um, I can, I, can I interject something here? I, I, I thought that as a board, as a commission, we did decide if we got funding from the town that we would make it for uh, residents only. Um, am I imagining that? That was, th that was the um, uh, discussion that if we, if we got the money, it would be residents only, but we don't know what we're getting. If we're getting. Yeah, we had a discussion. That's why I think Scott put down you know, different budgets and they were the last time you guys were talking, it was you were anticipating 100% funding from the town. Uh, I think that was the only way you said that we we're going to do that, but that was just discussion that I remember. But we I don't think we voted. That. We didn't vote on it. We just discussed. We, we never said that, Joe. No, we, no, said, I really well, said no. we never said we'd support 100% of that. Yeah, I realize right. that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, so if we can get to 100% one way or another with partial funding from the town and partial fees to, to the um, residents, um, aren't we still there? At this? I mean, aren't we? I, 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 you guys might have something in front can, of me. What, what does a, a year at Clear Pond tend to go for? I apologize if that's a sheet I should have obviously in front of me here. Uh, is it really about 52,000 somewhere around there? Or? Yeah, it's uh, between 55 and 58,000. That's very based on. Closure day, Scott. Right. You know, you, you got some some leeway there where it it would it might be a little less. Well, if um, we can't come to a consensus right now, then we need to. You guys need to decide what you want to do. But there's no way we can fund that kind of a difference, especially if you're asking us to fund the uh, capital projects that we're going to talk about, uh, which we are willing to fund. But from an operating standpoint, we can't fund that kind of money. Okay, so let's back up a second here. What, what, what would be the number that you, you, could, you would feel would be reasonable to fund? I, I don't have a number because you can't, you can't tell me what the, uh, what the uh, amount is going to be you know, as far as the fee is concerned, the gate fee, well, I don't know what the gate fees are, um, but how, what approach you want to take, you know, for this. I mean, I think that um, the number there that's uh, $2,500 um, is, um, 
very conservative. You know, it certainly, in my opinion, should be at least eight thousand dollars or more for the for the season passes. And plus, whatever that other section option is for the the guest the guest uh, passes, whatever that's got to be. Yeah, there are other revenues too. There's um, there's uh, group outing fees, um, uh, uh, family activity fees, um, swim lesson fees. So I mean, we could add all of those up and and get a um, somewhat of a uh, estimation of what the number would be that we you know we would still be uh, able to. Uh, Bring in for revenue. There's also uh, money from the um, concession stand. Um, I, you know, I'm just trying to see if there's any possible way we can get this done tonight, and and uh, you can get the budget in there. You know. Well, I think what needs to be done is there needs to be a performer done as far as Clay Pond is concerned. What the expenses are associated with it, and what the projected revenues are, and then you can figure out. But right now, I mean, you know. Um, it, it's tough to project the revenues on the concession stand if if we're going to be uh, in town only versus uh, everybody. I mean, it's twice as many people when it's open to in town and out of town. And uh, your concession stand is going to take a, a hit, probably 50 percent if we go back to just in town people, which is fine. But we just got to realize that. Well, I would like somebody to come up and propose those numbers and what those numbers are so we can take a look at it. I have, there's no backup here, you know, as far as, you know, I mean, I, I said, I don't know what these through $2,500 season passes mean. You know, I don't know what that means. You know, it makes to have two options, do a budget revenue and versus expenses with just residents versus residents and out of towners, just so we have apples to apples comparison. I mean, if your resident passes are 70% of your passes in 2019, this is all back of the napkin math, so take it for what it's worth. I mean, your concession stand would have been 11583 times 0.7, but $8,100 if it was just a perfect 70% residence, which it probably wasn't. So you're dropping about 3500 there. Yeah, but I mean, they should be able to do these. They should be able to do this for us, right? Come up, just show us the numbers. Yeah. Based, yeah. based on what they know today. I don't disagree. I'm just trying to do some quick stuff in my head. Does any of this get covered by the COVID uh, package deal there that uh, funds so many uh, things that didn't get covered during COVID? No, it doesn't. Okay. What, they are, what they are talking about is doing some revenue um, uh, funding previously, not going forward. Okay. And then split over three years, right? Right. So that'd be tough. I mean, just one quick, if we kept it the way it is for one another year, why can we just take an average of 18, 19, and 20? And those are the fees. You know, gate fees were roughly twenty thousand dollars, twenty three thousand dollars average for three years, right? Versus twenty five hundred. Unless I'm looking at something wrong, right? So why don't we? What's the big difference? You know, we had twenty nine thousand, twenty eighteen, twenty six thousand, twenty nineteen. We're saying twenty five hundred and twenty two. So awful, that's a big difference there. Unless I'm looking at it wrong. Right, but at the same time, Joe, the uh, season pass numbers are a big difference too. Right, that's, that's, that's what I'm wondering. I mean, if we had uh, ten thousand, six thousand, seventeen thousand, now we're saying twenty five hundred. I, I, you know, I don't know we got, we got some data to go by. If we kept things the way they are to make money this year, it seems to be money to be had there, which is what we're projecting. What can someone remind me of the gate fees? Is that Per vehicle, per person, per day, how much? Melly, what are what are the fees charged? It's it's per person per day. It's just walk off the street. <coughs> Joe, to answer your question, I believe the number 
went from $26,000 all the way down to $2,500 was because um, there wouldn't be any um, gate fees for residents if it was well, being funded. Well, this, this, but we're, we're in a heck of a deficit. Um, do we really want to change that now and lose all that money? I'm just answering your question. No, no I, I appreciate it. And I just asked, asked the question on top of that. Um, well, I believe Scott put together a, a, a version of this budget with no, with no funding from the town. Uh, did you, Scott, I believe it was one of the, he, he actually presented us as a board with four different um, scenarios. Um, we, we, we voted to, to present this to the town. So we need to get back to the drawing board, I believe. But it's not all the way back to the drawing board because we have that done. Is that correct, Scott? It's correct. This was the one that was decided to be provided, which was townspeople only, with the town contributing most of the money. Would this fall mostly on whether or not we can get back the 42 ish thousand on the management if there's no management fees? I mean, does that. Is that a silly way of looking at it? That, that, you yeah, folks that you've also decreased the percentage that we're going to get. So that's that's going to take a hit on our revenue also. Yeah, they, they'd have to hit about 300 grand to get back to like FY19 numbers, which well, they projected. You told me they were going to be doing a lot more than that. So, Oh, yeah. The, the next two years, they go up from uh, 300,000 in year one to uh, they projected 1.2 mil in year yeah. two, 1.5 in year yeah. three. Well, Projections and reality are two different things. Absolutely agree. Um, also, Brian, um, traditionally, um, the Clear Pond Park profit, uh, uh, the, uh, it's been always, um, sorry, I'm getting a little tired here. It's always been separated out as a um, isolated um, profit. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, we will always try to budget um, balance that budget separately with what we brought in versus what we could spend. And that was always how we budgeted for Clare Pond Park. It didn't have anything to do with um, the lodge or um, any of the other revenues. That was always our aim to, to make that a, uh, a net zero. It was our goal, but it never happened. Not in the last three years. Yeah, it used to happen. It happened. Say, you know, several years in a row, profit center was what I'm looking for. Question for Todd, if you're um, still out there with us. Um, have we allocated 100% of our community impact fees from the last year already? I'm not sure what you're referring to. Uh, the host community agreement community impact fees. So oh. what have we allocated already, the, the funds that we've taken in so far? I know they go into the general fund, but anything that's come in this year has gone to the general fund and will be part of the next certified free cash. All right. You know, um, one of the things we're, we're talking about, we're going to talk about, and we don't, we, you know, we probably should schedule another point, another meeting at this point is that, you know, the town is willing to put up significant money in the capital side you know, that we haven't even talked about yet, you know. So um, there's two sides to the puzzle here um, that are important. And, of course, you know, the retained earnings, you know, you've provided retained earnings for the past four or five years, and um, the retained earnings, you're not using any retained earnings, you know, to balance this budget. So if you were using retained earnings to balance the budget, we probably wouldn't be having this discussion. But... Based on that, because the retained earnings um, may or may not be available, we don't know, you know, at this point. But the key decision here is, is it going to be residents only or not? To Joe's point. Yeah. That's a decision you got to make. Then you can figure out the options as far as the budgets are concerned. But until that's, that's done, I, I don't know. Well, we're moving around in circles here because it's obviously some di di difference of opinion. 
if it was residents only, and I'm asking questions we might not have answers to, but just if anybody's got ideas, you might want to go back and think about them. You know, if it was residents only, and if we just said, okay, that if we just use the numbers in front of us, because that's all we have, if it did drop attendance to 70% or so, um, or even call it 60 to be conservative, uh, I mean, is there any way of reducing the cost? Are you able to rope off the beach, make the beach smaller? Do you, can you get rid of a, a lifeguard or two? Or I mean, am I just asking things that are completely out of line? I mean, can we drop that 52 to 58 a little bit? I had a question in regards to the maintenance at Clear Pond, which might drop some of the staff. Um, since the maintenance department is taking over so much of our, helping us so much, would they be uh, doing something like emptying the trash and cleaning up the bathrooms? And if that's part of maintenance, that in itself helps deplete, not deplete, but we can work with less staff. It, but I don't know where the cutoff point is as to what the maintenance department will do for us and what they don't do. I'm not sure on that. If somebody has an answer, I, I think it may clear up uh, the staffing um, issue too. Well, I can't answer I that question. Go ahead. I can answer that question. Um, one, of the other, one of our meetings, we also discussed um, the position, maintenance position that's been proposed by the, the DPW. Mm -hmm. um, and that is not, there you this DPW, man. Um, uh, that does not include cleaning bathrooms, emptying <laughs> trash, collecting fees, and uh, working in the snack bar. Um, Nelly and uh, has come up with a name for that, and that's an what an attendant instead of maintenance. It's an attendant, attendant. so that we can differentiate. Um, we we've gone over this at previous meetings. Um, uh, I spoke to to uh, Franklin, and I brought the, I talked to the the uh, the commission about this on Monday. Um, he's indicated what he feels he needs. Um, instead of having part-timers there, he'd like to see one 40 hour a week person. Um, I, I, and, uh, like he season. would oversee them. And from a financial statement uh, standpoint, it really doesn't have an effect. It doesn't, it was still paying that, um, those salaries. Um, it would just be a question of, uh, that person would be overseen by Franklin we would still oversee the attendance. Right. But I'm saying, um, Mike, that I don't expect them to be running the snack bar and be involved with food handling or, or any of those other things, but the attendant can uh, help with the bathrooms and empty the trash. And those kinds of, I may be wrong. I mean, I, Franklin, what's your thought? I thought exactly what Mike just said um, and what you guys talked about in your meeting on Monday. It's So you've had multiple part-time seasonal employees who did maintenance on both Clear Pond and bounced around to Ted Williams and did different things. I would take one 40-hour-a-week guy for 10 weeks. He would do all the grounds maintenance a clear pond, which would not include cleaning bathrooms or anything along those lines, as Mike just spoke of. It would be okay. purely ground maintenance. Trees, the trails, um, brush, cutting the fence line, all the things that fall under the ground maintenance category. And then in, he'd also empty the trash at John Pond because that was another thing that the maintenance guys would do. Um, and uh, and Would they do around. that at Clear Pond also? Uh, empty the trash? Is that something that would be done at Clear Pond? I mean, I don't see the outside trash, yeah. 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 Oh. I don't see why not. Um, but uh, that would be the extent of it. Okay. To get back to your question, your original question, Brian, I think that the overall um, costs could be, this is just my opinion, they could be reduced somewhat. However, um, like uh, lifeguards 
is a tough one because it doesn't matter if you have 100 people there or 150 people there, you still need a minimum amount of lifeguards, minimum amount of what we would call eyes on the water. Um, if you close down the raft, you might be able to save a, a lifeguard. So it could be, uh, you know, re reduced somewhat. That's just my opinion. The rest of the board. Um, yeah. No, thank you, Mike. I appreciate that. I mean, what I don't, I don't know how to read, you know, some of the personal services here, but like, what's our margin on the concession stand? I mean, does it, or what does it cost us to staff that throughout a season? And are our margins good enough that we would say, yeah, we definitely need that open or we, you know, would we save ourselves overall if we just said, look, we're going to open up the pond, but bring a cooler this year. Going back to basics. Well, we had discussed at one of our meetings, Brian, the possibility of uh, getting a vendor. Um, and they decided against it, but the vendor would have run Clear Pond, which would, I think Mike had mentioned, we would um, probably be able to cut an employee um, and you cut away problems with cash in the um, in the snack bar and let the vendor run it. And we don't have to pay for the food. We don't have to pay for an employee to run that uh, snack bar. And we can cut down on employees for clear pond, but um, the, the uh, commission uh, decided that they wanted not to have a vendor. So um, we can't go there. No, I respect the, the vote, but I guess my question just remains like, what does it cost to run it and what do we make? I guess that's, you know, or is the, you know, is the revenue forecast here already taking those costs into account? You know, does it bring in 20, but it costs you nine. So we've got 11 on the line here. I mean, do we know, do we know our margins? Is it worth it? I'm just trying to find a way to squeeze down. That's all. I'm sure you all have as well. Yeah, uh, my, okay. my answer to that would be yes, it is worth it. Okay. Okay, uh, it's 10 o'clock. You know, we've been going here for four hours. So uh, I think what we need to do is uh, schedule another meeting as uh, soon as possible because we've got a lot more to talk about, especially the capital items. So um, I guess I can uh, ask the board, and I don't know what the availability is of the uh, the Park Commission and whether the Finance Committee wants, wants to attend as well, but... Uh, um, so, and I think what we need to do is come up with some performance as, as Darren said, you know, what the alternatives are and so forth and the costs and kind of break down how many people are actually in these categories, the, the lifeguards and the maintenance people. I mean, I'm looking at, you know, 2009 season, which I'm trying to use as a comparison. And, uh, the budget for that year was, uh, 21,571 for guards and 18,000 for uh, maintenance. And the question is, I, I think that's about 10 people, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know the numbers, but um, okay. You know, we need all those guards. Do we need all those the maintenance people? We certainly need the supervisor. I mean, that that's true, but I think it all needs to be looked at. And uh, we got to do this pretty soon because we're going to be finalizing this budget probably the first week in April-ish um, to get everything all together. And uh, this is a factor. And, you know, also having to do with the capital, you know, plan and, uh, you know, quickly, you know, just talking about the high level of the capital plan, uh, what you requested. I mean, we're, we're committed to um, demo demoing the haunted house, which we've told you many times. Uh, we're committed to uh, funding the uh, repairs of the uh, tennis courts. Uh, we need to talk about uh, the other two because we don't. I don't think the repair to the building for twenty thousand dollars would do much. And then the uh, having to do with the office buildings, we need to talk about those those two issues as well. So um, and uh, that could take a while. So does anybody have a date they want to propose? Do we want to finish it up this week? Um. This week, I, 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 can't, I can't, well, unless you do it on a Saturday or Sunday, I'm not available tomorrow night. A little Monday, Monday night. Um, we actually, right now, tentatively, 
have a finance, a finance committee, a selectman's meeting, but we could probably, Brian, you know, if you have any objection, we could probably do it after the first item on our agenda. Can't do another four hour meeting. <laughs> I agree. You know, I got a little, little boy I'm trying to see here. So, <laughs> so if, if we, if we're able to knock that out quick, that's fine, but this is getting, um, getting a lot lately. Is Tuesday, is Tuesday a better day? I mean, any any day of the week is uh, whatever the is available for the selectmen. I think that. Uh, Rich, I think we have the regional school committee next Tuesday. We do Tuesday. We do. You're right. That's correct. So the only the only meeting, I, and then I have the planning board meeting on Thursday. And then, uh, so the only thing that I you know could do was. Uh, as I said, Monday night with the selectmen on Wednesday night, but other than night, yeah. Wednesday night? I, I don't know. I'm just throwing my dime out. I'm just, you know, I'm not speaking. I'm available on Monday, but not on Wednesday. Okay. So here, here we go. <laughs> no, nothing to do with you, Mike. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I'm happy to try to squeeze it in if we're efficient on Monday. Um, and obviously, we're waiting for things, Rich, which maybe we won't be ready Monday anyway. So, you know, there's a possibility this ends up being the only thing. I'm going to ask Leah as well, but I know she's committed for what we're already scheduling. Okay, so uh, do we want to try to shoot for Monday? Is Scott, is Scott available? I, I also think we need to talk, you know, what do we want to try to learn between then and now? What's possible? So what are the takeaways from this meeting that we're going to be able to make progress at the next one? We have we we should we need to to uh, nail down this clear pond park thing. Um, I believe we have a proposed budget with no funding that we did not submit, but we do have it, and we could fairly easily um, make some adjustments to it, right, Scott? I mean, just um, adjust down some of the um, costs. It's not going to go down that much, Brian. You know, it might go down some, but but it's, it won't be under 50, I'm sure. Okay, understood. I appreciate the effort. You know, I'd love to help you guys somehow. I just, I, I need to yeah. see a solid plan. Yeah, and the, what are the other items, uh, Rich, that need to, to be, I, the capital, obviously we need to talk about, but that shouldn't take a long well, the, time. The two capital items that are still up in the air is the, um, the, um, the building, you know, the, the quote unquote office building need to understand what we need to do with that, you know. OK. And then the other one is the. Um, the building down at the um, okay. Clear Pond. I mean, I don't I don't see that number. I mean, I, I could be wrong, but I don't know what makes up that number for twenty thousand dollars. So. And we we're going to try to talk about that. It's as John well. Pond Park. John Pond Park. Yeah. That's, um, yeah, that's, that's, uh, I think that's just making it safe. If I'm not mistaken, I don't know if Nathan's still here, but, uh, what, Joe, you guys met down there, right? Yeah, that was, uh, doing some demo work on the, in the back half, trying to save the front half. I don't think that included the renovations, Joe. Right, Joe. That okay. included the renovations, Joe? No, I think it was just demo in the back pipe, making that, you know, safe. Oh, it's nice. I don't want to speak for Nate on that one there, but uh, his concern was the back half of the building. There it is. He's still awake. Yeah. <laughs> I just ate a bag of uh, M and M's, <laughs> <laughs> getting a little frazzled. Uh, yeah. So, so when I, we did meet Joe out there and we talked about it briefly, um, twenty thousand would probably make it safe, just not usable. Uh, needs a roof, it's got holes in the floors, but at least it might take off that backside. So that's where that came from, Rich. Okay. All right. So, um, do we, uh, we already have a meeting scheduled? I'm sorry, Rich. Me to interrupt. Three twenty-two. Is that already in the books? Yeah, that's three twenty-two. Yeah. All right. I hate to ask this question: tennis courts, repair, and paint. Are we going after anybody to get some of that money back? We had a meeting about that. We're sending a letter out to the right Nelly maybe you want to address that <laughs> we're sending a letter to the pickle 
football group and <clears throat> explaining that they will not get a contract unless they paint the, uh, the courts. Prepare and paint? I guess the next question would be, how, I mean, uh, did Franklin review what needs to be done there, number one? Number two, how'd you come up with the $28,000? We did. We got a quote from companies that different options, like five different options, from the cracks, paint, and things like that. There, um, that's all we did. We, that's, that's where the number came from, Rich. Um, no, we have not gotten Franklin involved to see what it is. Well, if they could do anything for the cracks, I think we didn't ask them a question once. And it's not just regular street tie you're putting in these cracks. I guess it's more more than that. But I don't want to speak for them on that one there. So, but that's that's where the number came from. But you know. We need to get Franklin involved in things like this, Joe, so he understands what, you know, what's being done because he, I mean, he ran the whole park system down in the city of Bedford and he's got tons of experience and, you know, he needs to be involved in some of these discussions. So, so, so I don't know, I, nobody's seen the quotes or whatever. So that may be something that you need to provide us, you know, as well. So we can look at it and say, Hey, does this make sense or not? Because tennis courts can be uh, pretty tricky if they're not done right. I'll send it over to the board, to you, Rich, and, and the board. Okay, thank you. I like okay, so out, we got, go ahead. I'd like to yeah. point out that, that um, that's been on our want list for several years, and it just keeps getting pushed back. No, I don't have a problem with that, Mike. It's just that I, you know, want to make sure we don't get ourselves in the scenario that we get into the parking lots you know, about the costs and everything associated with it to make sure that, you know, it's the right number. That's all I'm saying. And we are supporting doing it. Hmm? I said we are supporting doing it. Okay, so uh, I think the Brian's point is um, what, uh, what do we need um, to... Um, To do, what do we need to prepare for when we meet, whatever that is? I, Darren's already made a proposal. Yeah, I like Darren's idea. Okay, so are we going to try to shoot for um, Monday night? Are we going to try to delay it until the 22nd? Which is that? I mean, the, the parks already, we already have a meeting scheduled for the 22nd. I think so. Uh, the parks group has some uh, homework to do uh, to get ready for this next meeting with you guys. Uh, obviously, we're going to get the details of Claire Pond revenue and expenses and take a look at our capital projects. So I think we have to meet as ourselves a little bit before we get back to everybody here. Okay. So we, we have a meeting on the 28th, 22nd, too, Joe. So, um, and we'll have to figure out. You know, what time? I mean, I don't know if it's a possibility. Uh, you know, we start a little earlier or whatever. Or, you know, you guys come later at the end of our meeting. So is that what we want to shoot for as the 22nd then? I think that gives enough time for everybody to go back, look at a few things and come up with some ideas. Okay. So we'll... Um, well, I, I, I think what Joe was saying is we, we need the 22nd to work on this. Is that what you're saying, Joe? I think we need, we didn't need some time to, to work on it before we uh, get back together. Okay. So, as a meeting, as a committee, uh, yeah. ourselves. Yes. So, um, I guess we could have our meeting on the twenty second, and then meet with you folks after you're done with yours, and we're done with ours. Is that what you is that what you're proposing? Yeah, I mean that's fine, but I think as as Brian pointed, you know, our meetings have been running for hours here because of the uh, budgets and so forth. And I that's think that's you get paid the big bucks, Rich. Yeah, right. <laughs> you can have my big bucks. Um, so uh, maybe we shoot for like uh, eight o'clock or something on the twenty second, uh, seven thirty or something like that, if that's okay. Works for me. Okay. Is that all right, Brian. Yeah, that's fine. We'll uh, we'll check in with Lee in the morning, but it should be good, I hope. Okay, um, so um, I'll entertain a motion that uh, to adjourn, Brian. 
Uh, so moved. Second. <clears throat> All in favor? Day aye. The camera aye. Mike? Uh, I make a motion that we adjourn the Park Commission at uh, 10.07 p.m. Second. Uh, all those in favor? Scott? Aye. Joe? Aye. Uh, 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 Paula? Aye. Uh, aye for me. Um, Darren, um, you need to close your meeting, but are you guys going to try to plan to attend that night too as well? or? On the 22nd? I mean, I, I can't speak for the other guys, but I can make it. Larry, you? Uh, 22nd is the confirmed date. Uh, yeah, I can do the 22nd. I can't Adam. do four hours, but I can do the 22nd. Okay. Adam, does that work for you? Yeah, 22nd works. Okay. So, yeah, please include us. Okay. All right. Um, so, okay. okay, I'll make a motion to adjourn the Finance Committee meeting at 10.08 p.m. Thank you, Larry. Second. Okay, we'll vote Larry. Cosby and I. Adam. I, Adam Lynch. Darren Beals, I. Okay. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Appreciate all the information.